in this very life the liberation teachings of the buddha by sayado u pandita sayado u pandita is the rarest kind of teacher one who can show us that freedom is as immediate as breathing as fundamental as a footstep in this very life book contains teachings given to western students in an intensive retreat it starts with basic instructions on sitting and walking meditation and goes on to describe in detail the stages of practice including recognizing and dealing with problems that arise as insight progressively deepens moment to moment examination of the mind and heart is linked to the words of the buddha in the original pali text drawing on 40 plus years teaching experience venerable u pandita's instructions are simple and concrete ideal for the beginner and advanced meditators alike enlivened by numerous case histories and anecdotes in this very life book is a matchless guide to the inner territory of meditation a clear reliable map leading to the complete freedom of the heart and mind described by the buddha saido u pandita entered a monastery in a remote village in burma at the age of 7 and progressed to become renowned as one of the outstanding teachers in the tradition of mahasi saido famed for reviving and developing a rigorous meditation technique found in ancient text saido u pandita teaches from his own profound meditative experience gained over 62 years of monastic training and from his detailed study of pali suttas forward when sayado u pandita first came to teach in the united states in 1944 we knew him only by reputation as the successor of mahasi sayado of burma but in ways that we could not have imagined at the time his teaching and presence helped to open many new doors of understanding as a meditation master he has guided us through the subtleties of practice as a scholar he has brought new meaning and life to the timeless words of the buddha and as a great spiritual friend he has inspired us to seek the highest freedom just as the buddha came from the warrior class of ancient india so to isado upandita a spiritual warrior of our time His emphasis on heroic effort is joined with a joyous confidence that liberation is possible in this very life. Sayadu has helped us recognize our own inner capacity to overcome the limitations of the conditioned mind. This book is a collection of talks from the first 3 month retreat that Sayado taught us the Inside Meditation Society. He described in detail both the practical journey of awakening and a profound theoretical model of understanding. These discourses reward a thoughtful reading. 
allowing the familiar aspects of the teachings to mature in our minds and challenging us with new perspectives on some old and cherished viewpoints. This book is a treasure house of applied Dhamma. May it help to awaken wisdom and compassion in all us. Joseph Goldstein To the reader, it is my humble and sincere wish to help you discover for yourself the state of inner peace through the essays in this book based on the Dhamma or the way of the truth taught by the Buddha and also following the tradition of the late Venerable Mahasi Saido of Rangoon, Burma. I am trying my best as far as my wisdom can take me to provide this service to you. The publication of these essays helps fulfill five beneficial purposes. First, it may give you access to new aspects of the Dhamma which you might have not heard before. Second, if you have already heard about these subjects, you may be able to consolidate your knowledge of the Dhamma. Third, if you have doubts, these essays may help you to clear them. Fourth, if you have certain pet views and preconceptions which are incorrect, you may be relieved of them by proper and respectful attention to the Dhamma of the Buddha. The last and perhaps the most fulfilling aspect is that you may be able to tally your own experiences with what is written in this book. If your practice is deep, it can be a joyous and rapturous occasion when you realize that your experiences conform to the theory. If you do not practice meditation, perhaps these essays can inspire you to begin. Then wisdom, the most potent medicine, can bring you relief from the suffering of your mind. I offer you my personal best wishes and encouragement. May you reach liberation, the highest goal. Saido Upandita Chapter 1 Basic Morality and Meditation Instructions We do not practice meditation to gain admiration from anyone. Rather, we practice to contribute to peace in the world. We try to follow the teachings of the Buddha and take the instructions of trustworthy teachers in hopes that we too can reach the Buddha's state of purity. Having realized this purity within ourselves, we can inspire others and share this Dhamma, this truth. The Buddha's teachings can be summed up in three parts. Sila, morality, Samadhi, concentration, and Panya, intuitive wisdom. Sila is spoken of first because it is the foundation for the other two. Its importance cannot be overstressed. Without sealer, no further practices can be undertaken. For lay people, the basic level of sealer consists of five precepts or training rules. Refraining from taking life. Refraining from taking what is not given. Refraining from sexual misconduct, refraining from lying, and refraining from taking intoxicating substances. These observances foster 
a basic purity that makes it easy to progress along the path of practice. A basic sense of humanity. Sila is not a set of commandments handed down by the Buddha, and it need not be confined to Buddhist teachings. It actually derives from a basic sense of humanity. For example, suppose we have a sprout of anger and want to harm another being. If we put ourselves in that other being's shoes, and honestly contemplate the action we have been planning, we will quickly answer, No, I wouldn't want that done to me. That would be cruel and unjust. If we feel this way about some action that we plan, we can be quite sure that the action is unwholesome. In this way, Morality can be looked upon as a manifestation of our senses of oneness with other beings. We know what it feels like to be harmed and out of loving care and consideration, we undertake to avoid harming others. We should remain committed to truthful speech and avoid words that abuse deceive or slander. As we practice refraining from angry actions and angry speech, then this gross and unwholesome mental state may gradually cease to arise, or at least it will become weaker and less frequent. Of course, anger is not the only reason we harm other beings. Greed might make us try to grab something in an illegal or unethical way. Or our sexual desire can attach itself to another person's partner. Here again, if we consider how much we could hurt someone, we will try hard to refrain from succumbing to lustful desire. Even in small amount, amounts, intoxicating substances can make us less sensitive, more easily swayed by gross motivations of anger and greed. Some people defend the use of drugs or alcohol, saying that these substances are not so bad. On the contrary, they are very dangerous. They can lead even a good-hearted person into forgetfulness. Like accomplices to a crime, intoxicants open the door to a host of problems. From just talking nonsense to inexplicable bursts of rage. To negligence, that could be fatal to oneself or others. Indeed, any intoxicated person is unpredictable. Abstaining from intoxicants is therefore a way of protecting all the other precepts. For those whose devotion make them wish to undertake a further discipline, there are also a set of eight and 10 precepts for lay people, 10 precepts for nuns, and the Vinaya or 227 rules for monks. There is more information about these forms of sealer in the glossary. Refinements during a retreat. During a meditation retreat, it becomes useful to change some of our conduct in ways that support the intensification of meditation practice. In a retreat, silence becomes the appropriate form of right speech and celibacy that of sexual conduct. One eats lightly to prevent drowsiness and to weaken sensual appetite. 
The Buddha recommended fasting from noon until the following morning. During the time one thus gains to practice, one may well discover that the taste of the Dhamma excels all worldly tastes. Cleanliness is another support for developing insight and wisdom. You should bathe, keep nails and hair trimmed, and take care to regulate the bowels. This is known as internal cleanliness. Externally, your clothing and bedroom should be tidy and neat. Such observance is said to bring clarity and lightness of mind. Obviously, you do not make cleanliness an obsession. In the context of a retreat, adornments, cosmetics, fragrances, and time-consuming practices to beautify and perfect the body are not appropriate. In fact, in this world, there is no greater adornment than purity of conduct, no greater refuge, and no other basis for the flowering of insight and wisdom. Sila brings a beauty that is not plastered onto the outside, but instead comes from the heart and is reflected in the entire person. Suitable for everyone, regardless of age, station or circumstance, truly it is the adornment of all seasons. So please be sure to keep your virtue fresh and alive. Even if we refrain our speech and actions to a large extent, however, Sila is not sufficient in itself to tame the mind. A method is needed to bring up the spiritual maturity to help us realize the real nature of life and to bring the mind to a higher level of understanding. That method is meditation. Meditation Instructions The Buddha suggested that either a forest place under a tree or any other very quiet place is the best for meditation. He said the meditator should sit quietly and peacefully with legs crossed. If sitting with crossed legs proves to be too difficult, other seating postures may be used. For those with back trouble, a chair is quite acceptable. It is true that to achieve peace of mind, we must make sure our body is at peace. So it is important to choose a position that will be comfortable for a long period of time. Sit with your back erect, at a right angle to the ground, but not too stiff. The reason for sitting straight is not difficult to see. An arched or crooked back will soon bring pain. Furthermore, the physical effort to remain upright without additional support energizes the meditation practice. Close your eyes. Now place your attention at the belly, at the abdomen. Breathe normally, not forcing your breath, neither slowing it down nor hastening it. Just a natural breath. You will become aware of certain sensations as you breathe in and the abdomen rises, as you breathe out and the abdomen falls. Now sharpen your aim and make sure that the mind is attentive to the entirety of each process. 
be aware from the very beginning of all sensations involved in the rising. Maintain a steady attention through the middle and the end of the rising. Then be aware of the sensations of the falling movement of the abdomen from the beginning through the middle and to the very end of falling. Although we describe the rising and falling as having a beginning, a middle and an end, this is only in order to show that your awareness should be continuous and thorough. We do not intend you to break these process into three segments. You should try to be aware of each of these moments from beginning to end as one complete process as a whole. Do not peer at the sensations with an over-focused mind, specifically looking to discover how the abdominal movement begins or ends. In this meditation, it is very important to have both effort and precise aim so that the mind meets the sensation directly and powerfully. One helpful aid to precision and accuracy is to make a soft mental note of the object of awareness, naming the sensation by saying the word gently and silently in the mind like rising, rising, falling, falling. Returning from wandering. There will be moments when the mind wanders off. You will still start to think of something. At this time, watch the mind. Be aware that you are thinking. To clarify this to yourself, note the thought silently with the verbal label. Thinking. Thinking. And come back to the rising and falling. The same practice should be used for objects of awareness that arise at any of what are called six sense doors, ear, eye, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Despite making an effort to do so, no one can remain perfectly focused on the rising and falling of the abdomen forever. Other objects inevitably arise and become predominant. Thus, the sphere of meditation encompasses all of our experiences, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, sensations in the body and the mental objects such as visions in the imaginations or emotions. When any of these objects arise, you should focus direct awareness on them and use a gentle verbal label spoken in the mind. During a sitting meditation, if another object impinges strongly on the awareness so as to draw it away from the rising and falling of the abdomen, this object must be clearly noted. For example, if a loud sound arises during your meditation, consciously direct your attention towards that sound as soon as it arises. Be aware of the sound as a direct experience and also identify it succinctly with the soft internal verbal label hearing, hearing. When the sound fades and is no longer predominant, 
come back to the rising and falling. This is the basic principle to follow in sitting meditation. In making the verbal label, there is no need for complex language. One simple word is best. For the eye, ear and tongue doors, we simply say, seeing, seeing, hearing, hearing, tasting, tasting. For the sensations in the body, we may choose a slightly more descriptive term like warmth, pressure, hardness, or motion. Mental objects appear to be present, a bewildering diversity. But actually they fall into just a few clear categories such as thinking, imagining, remembering, planning, and visualizing. But remember that in using this labeling technique, your goal is not to gain verbal skills. Labeling technique helps us to perceive clearly the actual qualities of our experience without getting immersed in the content. It develops mental power and focus. In meditation, we seek a deep, clear, precise awareness of the mind and body. This direct awareness shows us the truth about our lives, the actual nature of men mental and physical processes. Meditation need not come to an end after an hour of sitting. It can be carried out continuously through the day. When you get up from sitting, you must note carefully beginning with the intention to open the eyes. Intending, intending, opening, opening. Experience the mental event of intending and feel the sensations of opening the eyes. Continue to note carefully and precisely with full observing power through the whole transition of posture until the moment you have stood up and when you begin to walk. Throughout the day, you should also be aware of and mentally note all other activities such as stretching, bending your arm, taking a spoon, putting on clothes, brushing your teeth, closing the door, opening the door, closing your eyelids, eating and so forth. All these activities should be noted with careful awareness and a soft mental label. Apart from the hours of sound sleep, you should try to maintain continuous mindfulness throughout your waking hours. Actually, this is not a heavy task. It is just sitting and walking and simply observing whatever occurs. Walking Meditation During a retreat, it is usual to alternate periods of sitting meditation with periods of formal walking meditation of about the same duration, one after another, throughout the day. One hour is a standard period, but 45 minutes can be also used. 
for formal walking retreatants choose a lane of about 20 steps in length and walk slowly back and forth along it in daily life walking meditation can also be very helpful a short period say 10 minutes of formal walking meditation before sitting serves to focus the mind beyond this advantage the awareness developed in walking meditation is useful to all of us as we move our bodies from place to place in the course of a normal day walking meditation develops balance and accuracy of awareness as well as durability of concentration one can observe very profound aspects of the dhamma while walking and even get enlightened in fact a yogi who does not do walking meditation before sitting is like a car with a run down battery he or she will have a difficult time starting the engine of mindfulness when sitting walking meditation consists of paying attention to the walking process if you are moving fairly rapidly make a mental note of the movement of the legs left right left right and use your awareness to follow the actual sensations throughout the leg area if you are moving more slowly note the lifting moving and placing of each foot in each case you must try to keep your mind on just the sensations of walking notice what processes occur when you stop at the end of the lane when you stand still when you turn and begin walking again do not watch your feet unless this becomes necessary due to some obstacle on the ground it is unhelpful to hold the image of a foot in your mind while you are trying to be aware of sensations you want to focus on the sensations themselves and these are not visual for many people it is a fascinating discovery when they are able to have a pure bare perception of physical objects such as lightness tingling cold and warmth usually we divide walking into three distinct moments lifting moving and placing the foot to support a precise awareness we separate the moments clearly making a soft mental label at the beginning of each moment and making sure that our awareness follows it clearly and powerfully until it ends one minor but important point is to be begin noting the placing moment at the instant that the foot begins to move downwards a new world in sensations let us consider lifting we know its conventional name but in meditation it is important to penetrate behind that conventional concept and to understand the true nature of the whole process of lifting beginning with the intention to lift and continuing through the actual process which involves many sensations our effort 
to be aware of lifting the foot must neither overshoot the sensation nor weakly fall short of this target. Precise and accurate mental aim helps balance our effort. When our effort is balanced and our aim is precise, mindfulness will firmly establish itself on the object of awareness. It is only in the presence of these three factors, effort, accuracy, and mindfulness, that the concentration really develops. Concentration, of course, is collectedness of mind, one-pointedness. Its characteristic is to keep consciousness from becoming diffused or dispersed. As we get closer and closer to this lifting process, we will see that it is like a line of ants crawling across the road. From afar, the line may appear to be static but from closer up it begins to shimmer and vibrate and from even closer the line breaks up into individual ants and we see that our notion of a line was just an illusion. We now accurately perceive the line of ants as one ant after another ant after another ant exactly like this. When we look accurately at the lifting process from beginning to the end, the mental factor of quality of consciousness called insight comes nearer to the object of observation. The nearer insight comes, the clearer the true nature of the human mind that when insight arises and deepens through vipassana or insight meditation practice particular aspects of the truth about existence tend to be revealed in a def def definite order this order is known as the progress of insight The first insight which meditators commonly experience is to begin to comprehend, not intellectually or by reasoning, but quite intuitively, that the lifting process is composed of distinct mental and material phenomena occurring together as a pair. The physical sensations, which are material, are linked with, but different from, the awareness, which is mental. We begin to see a whole succession of mental events and physical sensations and to appreciate the conditionality that relates mind and matter we see with the greatest freshness and immediacy that mind causes matter. And when our intention to lift the foot initiates the physical sensations of movement, and we see that matter causes mind. As when a physical sensation of strong heat generates a wish to move our walking meditation into a shady spot. The insight into cause and effect can take a great variety of forms, but when it arises, our life seems far more simple to us than ever before. Our life is no more than a chain of mental and physical causes and effects. 
This is the second insight in the classical progress of insight. As we develop concentration, we see even more deeply that these phenomena of the lifting process are impermanent, impersonal, appearing and disappearing one by one at fantastic speed. This is the next level of insight, the next aspect of existence that concentrated awareness becomes capable of seeing directly. There is no one behind what is happening. The phenomena arise and pass away as an empty process, according to the law of cause and effect. This illusion of moment and solidity is like a movie. To ordinary perception, it seems full of characters and objects, all the semblances of a world. But if we slow the movie down, we will see that it is actually composed of separate static frames of film. Discovering the path by walking. When one is very mindful during a single lifting process, that is to say, when the mind is with the moment, penetrating with mindfulness into the true nature of what is happening at the moment, the path to liberation taught by the Buddha opens up. The Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path, often known as the Middle Way or Middle Path, consists of the eight factors of right view or understanding, right thought or aim, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. During any moment of strong mindfulness, five of the eight path factors come alive in consciousness. These are the right effort, there is mindfulness, this is one pointedness or concentration, there is right aim, and as we begin to having insight into the true nature of the phenomena, right weave also arises. And during a moment when these five factors of the eightfold path are present, consciousness is completely free from any sort of defilement. As we make use of that purified consciousness, to penetrate into the nature, true nature of what is happening, we become free of the delusion or illusion of self. We see only bare phenomena coming and going. When insight give us intuitive comprehension of the mechanism of cause and effect, how mind and matter are related to one another, we free ourselves of misconceptions about the nature of phenomena. Seeing that each object lasts only for a moment, we free ourselves of the illusion of permanence, the illusion of continuity. As we understand impermanence and its underlying unsatisfactoriness, we are freed from the illusion that our mind and body are not suffering. This direct seeing of impersonality brings freedom from pride and conceit. 
as well as freedom from the wrong view that we have an abiding self. When we carefully observe the lifting process, we see mind and body as unsatisfactory and so are freed from craving. These three states of mind, conceit, wrong view and craving are called the perpetuating dhammas. They help to perpetuate existence in samsara, the cycle of craving and suffering which is caused by ignorance of ultimate truth. Careful attention in walking meditation shatters the perpetuating dhammas, bringing us closer to freedom. You can see that noting the lifting of one's foot has incredible possibilities. There are no less present in moving the foot forward and in placing it on the ground. Naturally, the depth and detail of awareness described in these walking instructions should also be applied to noting the abdominal movement in sitting and all other physical movements. Five Benefits of Walking Meditation The Buddha described five additional specific benefits of walking meditation. The first is that one who does walking meditation will have the stamina to go on long journeys. This was important in the Buddha's time when bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, monks and nuns, had no form of transportation other than their feet and legs. You who are meditating today can consider yourselves to be bhikkhus and can think of this benefit simply as physical strengthening. The second benefit is that walking meditation brings stamina for the practice of meditation itself. During walking meditation, a double effort is needed. In addition to the ordinary, mechanical effort needed to lift the foot, there is also the mental effort to be aware of the movement and this is the factor of right effort from the Noble Eightfold Path. If this double effort continues through the movements of lifting, pushing and placing, it strengthens the capacity for that strong, consistent mental effort all yogis know is crucial to Vipassana practice. Thirdly, according to the Buddha, a balance between sitting and walking contributes to good health, which in turn speeds progress in practice. Obviously, it is difficult to meditate when we are sick. Too much sitting can cause many physical ailments. But the shift of posture and the moments of walking revive the muscles and stimulate circulation, helping prevent illness. The fourth benefit is that walking meditation assists digestion. Improper digestion produces a lot of discomfort and is thus a hindrance to practice. Walking keeps the bowels clear, minimizing sloth and torpor. After a meal and before sitting, 
one should do a good walking meditation to forestall drowsiness. Walking as soon as one gets up in the morning is also a good way to establish mindfulness and to avoid a nodding head in the first sitting of the day. Last but not least of the benefits of walking is that it builds durable concentration. As the mind works to focus on each section of the moment during a walking session, concentration becomes continuous. Every step builds the foundation for the sitting that follows, helping the mind stay with the object from the moment to moment. Eventually, to reveal the true nature of reality at the deepest level. This is why I use the simile of a car battery. If a car is never driven, its battery runs down. A yogi who never does walking meditation will have a difficult time getting anywhere when he or she sits down on the cushion. But one who is diligent in walking will automatically carry strong mindfulness and firm concentration into sitting meditation. I hope that all of you will be successful in completely carrying out this practice. May you be pure in your precepts cultivating them in speech and action, thus creating the conditions for developing samadhi and wisdom. May you follow these meditation instructions carefully, noting each moment's experience with deep, accurate and precise mindfulness so that you will penetrate into the true nature of reality. May you see how mind and matter constitute all experiences, how these two are interrelated by cause and effect, how all experiences are characterized by impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and absence of self, so that you may eventually realize Nibbana the unconditioned state that uproots mental defilements here and now. The Interview Vipassana meditation is like planting a garden. We have the seed of clear and complete vision, which is the mindfulness with which we observe phenomena. In order to cultivate this seed, nurture the plant and reap its fruit of transcendent wisdom, there are five procedures we must follow. These are called the five protections or the five nuggahitas. The five protections. As gardeners do, we must build a fence around our little plot to protect against large animals, deer and rabbits, who might devour our tender plant as soon as it tries to sprout. This first protection is Sila Nugahita Morality's protection against gross and wild behavior which agitates the mind and prevents concentration and wisdom from ever appearing. Second, we must water the seed this means listening to the discourse on the Dhamma 
and reading texts, then carefully applying the understanding we have gained. Just as overwatering will not will rot a seed, our goal is goal here is only clarification. It is definitely not to bewilder ourselves, getting lost in a maze of concepts. This second protection is called Sutta Nugahita. The third protection is the one I will dwell on here. It is Sakacha Nugahita, discussion with a teacher and it is likened to the many processes involved in cultivating a plant. Plants need to, plants need different things at different times. Soil may need to be loosened around the roots, but not too much or the roots will lose their grip in the soil. Leaves must be trimmed, again with care. Overshadowing plants must be cut down. In just this way, when we discuss our practice with a teacher, the teacher will give different instructions depending on what is needed to keep us on the right path. The fourth protection is Samatha Nuggahita, the protection of concentration, which keeps off the caterpillars and weeds of unwholesome states of mind. As we practice, we make a strong effort to be aware of whatever is actually arising at the six sense doors. Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind on their present moment. When the mind is sharply focused and energetic in this way, greed, hatred and delusion have no opportunity to creep in Thus, contradiction can be compared to weeding the area around the plant or to applying a very wholesome and natural type of pesticide. If these first four protections are present, insights have the opportunity to blossom. However, Yogis tend to become attached to early insights and unusual experiences related to strong concentration. Unfortunately, this will hinder their practice from ripening into the deeper levels of vipassana. Here, the fifth protection Vipassana Nuggahita comes into play. This is meditation which continues forcefully at a higher level. Not stopping to dwaddle in the enjoyment of peace of mind, no other pleasures of concentration. Craving for these pleasures is called Nikanti Tanha. It is subtle, like cobwebs, mild dew, tiny spiders, sticky little things that can eventually chalk off a plant's growth. Even if a yogi gets caught in such booby traps, however, a good teacher can find out about this in the interview and nudge him or her back into the straight path.
this is why discussing one's experiences with a teacher is such an important protection for meditation practice. The interview process. During an intensive vipassana retreat, personal interviews are held as often as possible, ideally every day. Interviews are formally structured. After a yogi presents his or her experiences as described below, the teacher may ask questions relating to particular details before giving a pithy comment or instruction. The interview process is quite simple. You should be able to communicate the essence of your practice in about 10 minutes. Consider that you are reporting on your research into yourself, which is what Vipassana actually is. Try to adhere to the standards used in the scientific world. Brevity accuracy and precision. First, report how many hours of sitting you did and how many walkings in the most recent 24 hour period. If you are quite truthful and honest about this, it will show the sincerity of your practice. Next, describe your sitting practice. It is not necessary to describe each sitting in detail. If sittings are similar, you may combine their traits together in a general report. Try using details from the clearest sitting or sittings. Begin your description with the primary object of meditation the rise and fall of the abdomen. After this, you may add other objects that arose at any of the six sense doors. After describing the sitting, go into your walking practice. Here, you must only describe experiences directly connected with your walking moments. Do not include a range of objects as you might in reporting a sitting. If you use the three-part method of lifting, moving and placing in your walking meditation, try to include each segment and the experiences you had with it. What occurred have you noted it? What happened to it? For all of these objects, indeed, with any object of meditation, please report your experience in three phases. One, you identify what occurred. Two, you report how you noted it. And three, you describe what you saw or felt or understood. That is what happened when you noted it. Let us take as an example the primary object, the rising and falling moment of the abdomen. The first thing to do is to identify the occurrence of this rising process. Rising occurred. The second phase is to note it. Give it a silent verbal label. I noted it as rising. The third phase is to describe what happened to the rising. As I noted rising, this is what I experienced. The different sensations I felt. This was the behavior of the sensations at that time. 
When you continue the interweave by using the same three-phase description for the fo falling process and the other objects that rise during sitting. You mentioned the object's occurrence. Describe how you noted it and relate your subsequent experiences until the object disappears or your attention moves elsewhere. Perhaps an analogy will serve to clarity. Imagine that I am sitting in front of you and suddenly I raised my hand into the air and open it so that you can see that I am holding an apple. You direct your attention towards this apple. You recognize it and you say the word apple to yourself. Now you go on to discern that the apple is red, round and shiny. At last, I slowly close my hand so that the apple disappears. How would you report your experience of the apple if the apple were your primary object of meditation? You would say, the apple appeared. I noted it as apple. And I noticed that it was red, round and shiny. Then the apple slowly disappeared. Thus, you would have reported in a precise way on the three phases of your involvement with the apple. First, there was the moment when the apple appeared and you became able to perceive it. Second, you directed your attention to the apple and recognize what it was since you were practicing meditation with the apple. You made the particular effort to label it verbally in your mind. Third, you continued attending to the apple and discerned its qualities, as well as the manner of its passing out of your awareness. This three-step process is the same one you must follow in actual vipassana meditation, except, of course, that you observe and report on your experiences of the rising and falling of your abdomen. One warning. Your duty to observe the fictitious apple does not extend to imagining the apple's juiciness or visualizing yourself eating it. Similarly, in a meditation interview, you must restrict your descriptions to what you have experienced directly rather than what you may imagine. Visualize an opinion about object. As you can see, this style of reporting is a guide for how awareness should be functioning in actual vipassana meditation. For this reason, meditation interviews are helpful for an additional reason beyond the chance to receive a teacher's guidance. Yogis often find that being required to produce a report of this kind has a galvanizing effect on their meditation practice, for it asks them to focus on their experiences as clearly as they possibly can. Awareness, Accuracy, Perseverance It is not enough to look at the object indifferently, haphazardly, or in an unmindful, automatic way. 
This is not a practice where you mindlessly recite some mental formula. You must look at the object with full commitment, with all of your heart, directing your whole attention towards the object as accurately as possible. You keep your attention there so that you can penetrate into the object's true nature. Despite our best efforts, the mind may not always be so well behaved as to remain with our abdomen. It wanders off. At this point, a new object, a wandering mind, has arisen. How do we handle this? You become aware of the wandering. This is the first phase. Now the second phase, we label it as wandering, wandering. How soon after its arising were we aware of the wandering? One second, two minutes, half an hour? And what happens after we label it? Does the wandering mind disappear instantly? Does the mind just keep on wandering? Or do the thoughts reduce in intensity and eventually disappear? Does a new object arise before we have seen the disappearance of the old one? If you cannot note the wandering mind at all, you should tell the teacher about this too. If the wandering mind disappears, you come back to the rising and falling. You should make a point to describe whether you are able to come back to it. In your reports, it is good also to say how long the mind usually remained with the rising and falling movements before a new object arose. Pains and aches, unpleasant sensations are sure to arise after some time of sitting. Say an itch suddenly appears, a new object. You label it as itching. Does the itch get worse or remain the same? Does it change or disappear? Do new objects arise, such as a wish to scratch? All this should be described as precisely as possible. It is the same with visions and sights, sounds and tastes, heat and cold, tightness, vibrations, tinglings, an unending procession of objects of consciousness. No matter what the object, you only have to apply the same three-step principle to it. All of this process is done at a silent investigation coming very close to our experience not asking ourselves a lot of questions and getting lost in thought what is important to the teacher is whether you could be aware of whatever object has arisen whether you had the accuracy of mind to be mindful of it and the perseverance to observe it fully. Be honest with your teacher. If you are unable to find the object or note it or experience anything at all after making a mental label, it may not always mean that you are practicing poorly. A clear and precise report enables the teacher to assess your practice, then point out mistakes 
or make corrections to put you back on the right path. May you benefit from these interview instructions. May a teacher someday help you help yourself. Chapter 2 Cutting Through to Ultimate Reality by Sharpening the Controlling Faculties Vipassana meditation can be seen as a process of developing certain positive mental factors until they were powerful enough to dominate the state of the mind quite continuously. These factors are called the controlling faculties and they are five in numbers. Faith, effort or energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. Especially in an intensive retreat sitting, proper practice develops strong and durable faith powerful effort, deep concentration, penetrative mindfulness, and the unfolding of more and more profound insight or wisdom. This final product, intuitive wisdom or panya, is the force in the mind which cuts through into the deepest truth about reality and thus liberates us from ignorance and it results. Suffering, delusion and all the forms of unhappiness. For this development to occur, however, the appropriate cause must be present. Nine causes lead to the growth of the controlling faculties. They are listed here and will be discussed in more detail below. The first cause is 
attention directed toward the impermanence of all objects of consciousness. The second is an attitude of care and respect in meditation practice. The third is maintaining an unbroken continuity of awareness. The fourth cause is an environment that supports meditation. The fifth is remembering circumstances or behavior that have been helpful in one's past meditation practices so that one can maintain or recreate those conditions, especially when difficulties may arise. The sixth is cultivating the qualities of mind which leads towards enlightenment. The seventh is willingness to work intensely in meditation practice. The eighth is patience and perseverance in the face of pain or other obstacles. The ninth and the last cause for the development of the controlling faculties is a determination of continue practicing until one reaches the goal of liberation. A yogi can travel far in this practice if he or she fulfills even just the first three courses for the controlling faculties to arise. That is, the yogi's mental state will come to be characterized by faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom if she or he is aware of the passing away of mental and physical phenomena meticulously, respectfully, and with persistent continuity. Under these conditions, the inner hindrances to meditation will soon be removed. The controlling faculties will calm the mind and clear it of disturbances. If you are such a yogi, you will experience a tranquility you may never have felt before. You may be filled with awe. Oh, fantastic! It's really true. All those teachers talk about peace and calm, and now I am really experiencing it. Thus, faith, the first of the controlling faculties, will have arisen out of your practice. This particular kind of faith is called preliminary verified faith. Your own experiences lead you to feel that the further promises of Dhamma may actually be true. With faith comes a natural inspiration and upsurge of energy. When energy is present, effort follows. You will say to yourself, this is just the beginning. If I work a little harder, I will have experiences even better than this. A renewed effort guides the mind to hit its target of observation in each moment. Thus, mindfulness consolidates and deepens. Mindfulness has the uncanny ability to bring about concentration, one-pointedness of mind. When mindfulness penetrates into the object of observation, moment of moment, the mind gains the capacity to remain stable and undistracted, content within the object. In this natural fashion, concentration becomes well established and strong. In general, the stronger one's mindfulness, 
the stronger one's concentration will be. With faith, effort, mindfulness, and concentration, four of the five controlling faculties have been assembled. Wisdom, the fifth, needs no special introduction. If the first four factors are present, wisdom or insight unfolds of itself. One begins to see very clearly, intuitively, how mind and matter are separate entities and begins also to understand in a very special way how mind and matter are connected by cause and effect. Upon each insight, one's verified faith deepens. A yogi who has seen objects arising and passing away from moment to moment feels very fulfilled. It's fabulous. Just moment after moment of these phenomena with no self behind them, no one at home. This discovery brings a sense of great relief and ease of mind. Subsequent insights into impermanence, suffering, and absence of self have a particularly strong capacity to stimulate faith. They fill us with powerful conviction that the Dharma, as it has been told to us, is authentic. Vipassana practice can be compared to sharpening a knife against a whetstone. One must hold the blade at just the right angle, not too high or not too low, and apply just the right amount of pressure, moving the knife blade constantly against the stone. One works continuously and until the first edge has been developed. Then, one flips the knife over to sharpen the other edge, applying the same pressure at the angle, at the same angle. This image is given in the Buddhist scriptures. Precision of angle is like meticulousness in practice, and pressure and movement are like continuity of mindfulness. If meticulousness and continuity are really present in your practice, rest assured that in a short time, your mind will be sharp enough to cut through to the truth about existence. 1. Attention of Impermanence The first cause for development of the controlling faculties is to notice that everything which arises will also dissolve and pass away. During meditation, one observes mind and matter at all the six sense doors. One should approach this process of observation with the intention to notice that everything which happens will in turn dissolve. As you are no doubt aware, this idea can only be confirmed by actual observation. This attitude is very important preparation for the practice. A preliminary acceptance that things are impermanent and Transitory prevents the reactions that might occur when you discover these facts, something painful through your own experience. Without this acceptance, moreover, a student might spend considerable time with the contrary assumption that the object of this world might be permanent, an assumption 
that can block the development of insight. In the beginning, you can take impermanence on faith. As practice deepens, this faith will be verified by personal experience. 2. Care and Respect The second basis for strengthening the controlling faculties is an attitude of great care in pursuing the meditation practice. It is essential to treat the practice with the utmost reverence and meticulousness. To develop this attitude, it may be helpful to reflect on the benefits you are likely to enjoy through practice. Properly practiced, mindfulness of body, feelings, mind and mind objects lead to the purification of the mind, the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, the complete destruction of physical pain and mental distress, and the attainment of Nibbana. The Buddha called it Satipatthana meditation, meaning meditation on the four foundations of mindfulness. Truly, it is priceless. Remembering this, you may be inspired to be very careful and attentive towards the objects of awareness that arise at the six sense doors. On a meditation retreat, you should also try to slow down your moments as such as possible, appreciating the fact that your mindfulness is at an infant stage. Slowing down gives mindfulness the chance to keep pace with the moments of the body, noting each one in detail. The scriptures illustrate this quality of care and meticulousness with the image of a person crossing a river on a very narrow footbridge. There is no railing and swift water runs below. Obviously, this person cannot skip and run across the bridge. He or she must go step by step with care. A meditator can also be compared to a person carrying a bowl brimful of oil. You can imagine the degree of care that is required not to spill it. This same degree of mindfulness should be present in your practice. This second example was given by the Buddha himself. It, it seems there was a group of monks residing in a forest, ostensibly practicing meditation. They were sloppy though, at the end of the sitting, they would leap up suddenly and unmindfully, walking from place to place. They were careless. They looked at the birds in the trees and the clouds in the sky, not restraining their minds at all. Naturally, they made no progress in practice. When the Buddha came to know of this, his investigation showed that the fault lay in the monk's lack of respect and reverence for the Dhamma, for the teaching and for meditation. The Buddha then approached the monks and spoke to them about the image of carrying a bowl of oil. Inspired by this sutta or discourse, the monks resolved thereafter to meticulousness and carefully in all they did. As a result, they were enlightened in a short time. You can verify this result in your own experience 
on a retreat, slowing down, moving with great care. You will be able to apply a quality of reverence in noting your experience. The slower you move, the faster you will progress in your meditation. Of course, in this world one must adapt to the prevailing circumstances. Some situations require speed. If you cruise the highway at a snail's pace, you might end up dead or in jail. At a, hospi at a hospital, in contrast, patients must be treated with great gentleness and allowed to move slowly. If doctors and nurses hurry them along so that the hospital's work can be finished more efficiently, the patients will suffer and perhaps end up on the mortuary slab. Yogis must comprehend their situation wherever they are and adapt to it on retreat or in any other situation. It is good to be considerate and to move at a normal speed if others are waiting behind you. However, you must also understand that one's primary goal is to develop mindfulness. And so when you are alone, it is appropriate to revert to creeping about. You can eat slowly. You can wash your face. Brush your teeth and bathe with great mindfulness as long as no one is waiting in line for the shower or tub. 3. Unbroken Continuity Preserving continuity of mindfulness is the third essential factor in developing the controlling faculties. One should try to be with the moment as much as possible, moment after moment, without any breaks in between. In this way, mindfulness can be established and its momentum can increase. Defending our mindfulness prevents the kilesas, the harmful, painful qualities of greed hatred and delusion from infiltrating and carrying us off into oblivion. It is a fact of life that the kilesas cannot arise in the presence of strong mindfulness. When the mind is free of kilesas, it becomes unburdened, light and happy. Do whatever is necessary to maintain continuity. Do one action at a time. When you change postures, break down the moment into single units and note each unit with the utmost care. When you arise from sitting, note the intention to open the eyelids and then the sensations that occur when the lids begin to move. Note lifting the hand from the knee, shifting the leg, and so on. Throughout the day, be fully aware of even the tiniest actions, not just sitting, standing, walking, and lying, but also closing your eyes, turning your head, turning doorknobs, and so forth. Apart from the hours of sleeping, yogis on retreat should be continuously mindful. Continuity should be so strong, in fact, that there is no time at all for reflection, no hesitation, no thinking, no reasoning, no comparing of one's experiences with the things one has read about meditation. 
just time enough to apply this bear awareness. The scriptures comparing practicing the Dhamma to starting a fire. In the days before the invention of matches or magnifying glasses, fire had to be started by the primitive means of friction. People used an instrument like a bow held horizontally in its looped string, they entwined a vertical stick whose point was inserted into a slight depression on a board, which was in turn filled with shavings or leaves. As people moved the bow back and forth, the string's point twirled eventually igniting the leaves or shavings. Another method was simply to roll that same stick between the palms of the hands. In either case, people rubbed and rubbed until sufficient friction accumulated to ignite the shavings. Imagine what would happen if they rubbed for 10 seconds and then rested for 5 seconds to think about it. Do you think a fire would start? In just this way, a continuous effort is necessary to start the fire of wisdom. Have you ever studied the behavior of a chameleon? The scriptures use this lizard to illustrate this continuous practice. Chameleons approach their goals in an interesting way. Catching sight of a delicious fly or a potential mate, a chameleon rushes suddenly forward, but does not arrive all at once. It scurries a short distance, then stops and gazes at the sky, tilting its head this way and that. Then it rushes ahead a bit more and stops again to gaze. It never reaches its destination in the first rush. People who practice in fits and starts, being mindful for a stretch and then stopping to daydream are chameleon yogis. Chameleons manage to survive despite their lack of continuity, but a yogi's practice may not. Some yogis feel called to reflect and think each time they have a new experience, wondering which stage of insight they have reached. Others do not need novelty. They think and worry about familiar things. I feel tired today. Maybe I didn't sleep enough. Maybe I ate too much. A little nap might be just the ticket. My foot hurts. I wonder if a blister is developing. That would affect my whole meditation. Maybe I should just open my eyes and check. Such are the hesitations of chameleon yogis. For Supportive conditions. The fourth cause for developing the controlling faculties is to make sure that suitable conditions are met for insight to unfold. Proper, suitable and appropriate activities can bring about insight knowledge. Seven types of suitability 
should be met in order to create an environment that is supportive of meditation practice. The first suitability is that of place. A meditative environment should be well furnished, well supported, a place where it is possible to gain insight. Second is what is known as suitability of resort. This refers to the ancient practice of daily alms rounds. A monk's place of meditation should be far enough from a village to avoid distraction, but near enough so that he can depend on the villagers for daily alms food. For lay yogis, food must be easily and consistently available, yet perhaps not distractingly so. Under this heading, one should avoid places which ruin one's concentration. This means busy, active places where the mind is likely to be distracted from its meditation object. In short, a certain amount of quiet is important, but one must not go so far from the noises of civilization that one cannot obtain what one needs to survive. The third suitability is that of speech. During a retreat, suitable speech is of a very limited kind and quantity. The commentaries define it as listening to Dhamma talks. We can add participating in Dhamma discussions with the teacher, that is, interviews. It is essential at times to engage in discussions of the practice, especially one is confused or unsure about, especially when one is confused or unsure about how to proceed. But remember that anything in excess is harmful. I once taught in a place where there was a potted plant which my attendant was overzealous in watering. All its leaves fell off. A similar thing could happen to your samadhi if you get involved in too many Dhamma discussions. And one should carefully evaluate even the discourses of one's teacher. The general rule is to exercise discretion as to whether what one is hearing will develop the concentration that has already arisen or cause to arise concentration that has not yet arisen. If the answer is negative, one should avoid the situation. Perhaps even choosing not to attend the teacher's discourses or not requesting extra interviews. Yogis on intensive retreat should of course avoid any kind of conversation as much as possible, especially chatting about worldly affairs. Even serious discussion of the Dhamma is not always appropriate during intensive practice. One should avoid debating points of dogma with fellow yogis on the retreat. Thoroughly unsuitable during retreats are conversations about food, place, business, the economy, politics, and so forth. These are called animal speech. The purpose of having this kind of prohibition is to prevent distractions from arising in the yogi's mind. Lord Buddha 
out of deep compassion for meditating yogis, said, For an ardent meditator, speech should not be indulged. If indeed speech is resorted to frequently, it will cause much distraction. Of course, it may become really necessary to talk during a retreat. If so, you should be careful not to exceed what is absolutely necessary to communicate. You should also be mindful of the process of speaking. First, there will be a desire to speak. Thoughts will arise in the mind as to what to say and how to say it. You should note and carefully label all such thoughts. The mental preparation for speaking and then the actual act of speaking itself. The physical movements involved. The movements of your lips and face and any accompanying gestures should be made the objects of mindfulness. Some years ago in Burma, there was a high-ranking government official who just had retired. He was a very ardent Buddhist. He had read a lot of Buddhist scriptures and literature in the fine translations available in Burmese and had also spent some time meditating. His practice was not strong, but he had a lot of general knowledge and he wanted to teach, so he became a teacher. One day he came to the center of Rangon to meditate. When I give instructions to yogis, usually I explain the practice and then compare my instructions to the scriptural text, trying to reconcile any apparent differences. This gentleman immediately began to ask me, from where did this quotation come and what is its reference? I advised him politely to forget about this concern and to continue his meditation. But he could not. For three days in a row, he did the same thing at each interview. Finally, I asked him, Why are you here? Did you come here to be my student or to try to teach me? It seems to me he had only come to show off his general knowledge, not because he wished to meditate. The man, the man said airily, Oh, I'm the student and you're the teacher. I said, I've been trying to let you know this is this in a subtle way for three days. But I must now be more direct with you. You are like the minister whose job it is to marry off brides and bridegrooms. On the day it was his turn to get married, instead of standing where the bridegroom should stand, he went up to the altar and conducted the ceremony. The congregation was very surprised. Well, the gentleman got the point. He admitted his error and thereafter became an obedient student. Yogis who truly want to understand the Dhamma will not seek to imitate this gentleman. In fact, it is said in the text that no matter how learned or experienced one may be, during a period of meditation, one should behave like a person 
who is incapable of doing things out of his out of his or her own initiative but is but is also very meek and obedient in this regard i'd like to share with you an attitude i developed in my youth when i am not skilled competent or experienced in a particular field i do not intrude in a situation even if i am skilled competent and experienced in a field i do not intrude unless someone asks for my advice the fourth suitability is that of a person which chiefly relates to the meditation teacher if the instruction given by one's teacher helps one to progress developing concentration that has already arisen or bringing about concentration that has not yet arisen then one can say that this teacher is suitable two more aspects of suitability of person have to do with the community that supports one's practice and one's own relationship with the community of other people in an intensive retreat yogis required a great deal of support in order to develop their mindfulness and concentration they abandon worldly activities thus they need friends who can perform certain tasks that would be distracting for a yogi in intensive practice such as shopping for and preparing food repairing the shelter and so on for those engaged in group practice it is important to consider one's own effect on the community delicate consideration for other yogis is quite helpful abrupt or noisy movements can be very disruptive to others bearing this in mind one can become a suitable person with respect to other yogis the fifth area of suitability of food means that the diet one finds personally appropriate is also support supportive to progress in meditation however one must bear in mind that it is not always possible to fill one's every preference group retreats can be quite large and meals are cooked for everyone at once at such times it is best to adopt an attitude of accepting whatever is served if one's meditation is disturbed by feelings of lack or distaste it is all right to try to rectify this if convenient the story of martika mata once 60 monks were meditating in the forest they had a lay woman supporter named martika mata who was very devout she tried to figure out what they might like and every day she cooked enough food for all of them one day martika mata approached the monks and asked whether a lay person could med- meditate as they did of course she was told and they gave her instructions happily she went back and began to practice 
She kept up her meditation even while she was cooking for the monks and carrying out her household chores. Eventually, she reached the third stage of enlightenment, anagami, or non-returner. And because of the great merit she had accumulated in the past, she also had psychic powers such as the Deva Eye and Deva Ear, the ability to see and hear distant things, and the ability to read people's mind. Filled with joy and gratitude, Matikamata said to herself, The Dhamma I have realized is very special. I am such a busy person, though looking after my household chores as well as feeding the monks every day, I'm sure those monks have progressed much further than I. With her psychic powers, she investigated the meditation progress of the 60 monks and so to her shock that none of them had had even the vaguest ghost of vipassana in sight. What's wrong here? Matikamata wondered. Psychically, she looked into the monk's situation to determine where the unsuitability lay. It was not in the place they were meditating. It was not because they were not getting along. But it was that they were not getting the right food. Some of the monks liked sour tastes. Others preferred the salty. Some like hot peppers and others like cakes. And still others preferred vegetables. Out of great gratitude for the meditation instructions she had received from them, which had led her to profound enlightenment, Matikamata began to cater to each monk's preference. As a result, all the monks soon became arahants, fully enlightened ones. This woman's rapid and deep attainment, as well as her intelligence and de dedication, provide a good model for people like parents and other caretakers who serve the needs of others, but who do not need to relinquish aspirations for deep insights. While on this subject, I would like to talk about vegetarianism. Some hold the view that it is moral to eat only vegetables. In Theravada Buddhism, there is no notion that this practice lead to an exceptional perception of the truth. The Buddha did not totally prohibit the eating of meat. He only laid down certain conditions for it. For example, an animal must not be killed expressly for one's personal consumption. The monk Devadatta asked him to lay down a rule expressly forbidding the eating of meat but the Buddha, after thorough consideration, refused to do so. In those days as now, the majority of people ate a mixture of animal and vegetable food. Only Brahmins or the upper caste were vegetarian. When monks went begging for their livelihood, 
they had to take whatever was offered by donors of any caste. To distinguish between vegetarian and carnivorous donors would have affected the spirit of this activity. Furthermore, both Brahmins and members of other castes were able to join the order of monks and nuns. The Buddha took this fact into consideration as well with all of its implications. Thus, one need not restrict oneself to vegetarianism to practice the Dhamma. Of course, it is healthy to eat a balanced vegetarian diet. And if your motivation for not eating meat is compassion, this impulse is certainly wholesome. If, on the other hand, your metabolism is adjusted to eating meat, or if for some other reason of health it is necessary for you to eat meat, this should not be considered sinful or in any way detrimental to the practice. A law that cannot be obeyed by the majority is ineffective. The sixth type of suitability is that of weather. Human beings have a fantastic ability to adapt to weather. No matter how hot or cold it may be, we devise methods of making ourselves comfortable. When these methods are limited or unavailable, one's practice can be disrupted. At such times, it may be better to practice in a temperate climate, if possible. The seventh and last kind of suitability is that of posture. Posture here refers to the traditional four postures, sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. Sitting is best for samatha or tranquility meditation. In the tradition of Mahasi Sayadaw, vipassana practice is based on sitting and walking. For any type of meditation, once momentum builds, posture does not really matter. Any of the four is suitable. Beginning yogis should avoid the lying and the standing postures. The standing posture can bring about pain in a short while, tightness and pressure in the legs which can disrupt the practice. The lying posture is problematic because it brings on drowsiness. In it, there is not much effort being made to maintain the posture and there is too much comfort. Investigate your own situation to find out whether the seven types of suitability are present. If they are not, perhaps you should take steps to ensure they are fulfilled so that your practice can be developed. If this is done with the aim of making progress in your practice, it will not be self-centered. 5. Reapplying helpful conditions from the past. The fifth way of sharpening the controlling faculties is to bring about the completion of meditative insight using what is called the sign of Samadhi. This refers to circumstances in which good practice 
has occurred before. Good mindfulness and concentration. As we all know, practice is an up and down affair. At times we are high up in the clouds of Samadhi land and other times we are really depressed, assaulted by kilesas, not mindful of anything. Using the sign of Samadhi means that when you are up in those clouds, when mindfulness is strong, you should try to notice what circumstances led to this good practice. How are you working with the mind? What are the specific circumstances in which this good practice is occurring? The next time you get into a difficult situation, you may be able to remember the cause of good mindfulness and establish them again. 6. Cultivating the factors that led to enlightenment. The sixth way of sharpening the controlling faculties is cultivating the factors of enlightenment. Mindfulness, investigation, energy, rapture or joy, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. These qualities of mind or mental factors are actually the causes which bring about enlightenment. When they are present and alive in one's mind, the moment of enlightenment is being encouraged and may be said to be drawing nearer. Furthermore, the seven factors of enlightenment belong to what is known as noble path and fruition consciousness. In Buddhism, we speak of consciousness when we mean specific, momentary types of consciousness, particular mental events with recognizable characteristics. Path and fruition consciousness are the linked mental events that constitute an enlightenment experience. They are what is occurring when the mind shifts its attention from the conditions realms to Nibbana or unconditioned reality. The result of such a shift is that certain defilements are uprooted so that the mind is never the same afterwards. While working to create the conditions for path and fruition consciousness, a yogi who understands the factors of enlightenment can use them to balance her or his meditation practice. The enlightenment factors of effort, joy and investigation uplift the mind when it becomes depressed, while the factors of tranquility, concentration and equanimity calm the mind when it becomes hyperactive. Many times a yogi may feel depressed and discouraged, having no mindfulness, thinking that his or her practice is going terribly badly. Mindfulness may not be able to pick up objects as it has in the past. At such a time, it is essential for a yogi to pull out of this state, brighten the mind. He or she should go in search of encouragement and inspiration. 
One way to do this is by listening to good Dhamma talk. A talk can bring about the enlightenment factor of joy or rapture. Or it can inspire greater effort. Or it can deepen the enlightenment factor of investigation by providing knowledge about practice. These three factors of enlightenment, rapture, effort, and investigation are most helpful in facing depression and discouragement. Once an inspiring talk has brought up the rapture, energy, or investigation, you should use this opportunity to try to focus the mind very clearly on objects of observation so that the objects appear very clearly to the mind's eye. At other times, yogis may have an unusual experience or for some other reason may find themselves flooded with acceleration, rapture, and joy. The mind becomes active and over-enthusiastic. On a retreat, you can spot such yogis beaming, walking around, as if they were six feet above the ground. Due to excess energy, the mind slips. It refuses to concentrate on what is happening in the present moment. If attention touches the target object at all, it immediately goes off on a tangent. If you find yourself excessively accelerated, you should restore your equilibrium by developing the three enlightenment factors of tranquility concentration, and equanimity. A good way to start is by realizing that your energy is indeed excessive and then reflecting. There is no point in hurrying. The Dhamma will unfold by itself. I should just sit back coolly and watch the gentle awareness. This stimulates the factor of tranquility. Then, once the energy is cooled, one can begin to apply concentration. The practical method of doing this is to narrow down the meditation. Instead of noting many objects, cut down to concentrate more fully on a few. The mind will soon renew its normal, slower pace. Lastly, one can adopt a stance of equanimity, cajoling and soothing the mind with reflections like, a yogi has no preferences, there is no point in hurrying, the only thing that matters is for me to watch whatever is happening good or bad. If you can keep your mind in balance, soothing excitement and lightening up depression, you can be sure that wisdom will shortly unfold on its own. Actually, the person best qualified to rectify imbalances in practice is a competent meditation teacher. If he or she keeps steady track of students through interviews, a teacher can recognize and remedy the many kinds of excess that yogis are susceptible to. I would like to remind all yogis never to feel discouraged when they think something is wrong with their meditation. Yogis are like babies or young children. As you know, 
babies go through various stages of development. When babies are in a transition from one stage of development to another, they tend to go through a lot of physiological and physical upheaval. They seem to get irritated very easily and are difficult to care for. They cry and wail at odd, odd times. An inexperienced mother may worry about her baby during periods like this. But truly, if infants don't go through this suffering, they will never mature and grow up. Baby's distress is often a sign of development progress, developmental progress. So if you feel your practice is falling apart, do not worry. You may be just like that little child who is in a transition between stages of growth. 7. Courageous Effort The seventh way of developing the controlling faculties is to practice with courageous effort. So much so that you are willing to sacrifice your body and life in order to continue the practice uninterrupted. This means giving rather less consideration towards the body than we tend to be accustomed to give to it. Rather than spending time beautifying ourselves or catering to our wishes for greater comfort, we devote as much energy as possible to giving forward in meditation. Although it may feel very youthful right now, your body becomes completely useless when we die. What use can one make of a corpse? The body is like a very fragile container which can be used as long as it is intact. But the moment it drops on the floor, it is of no further help to us. While we are alive and in reasonably good health, we have the good fortune to be able to practice. Let us try to extract the precious essence from our bodies before it is too late, before our bodies become useless corpse. Of course, it is not our aim to hasten this event. We would also try to be sensible and to maintain this body's health if only for our practice to continue. You might ask what essence one can extract from the body. A scientific study was once made to determine the market value of the substances composing the human body, iron, calcium, and so on. I believe it came to less than one American dollar and the cost of extracting all those components was many times greater than this total value. Without such a process of extraction, a corpse is valueless, beyond providing compost for the soil. If a dead person's organs can be used for transplant into living bodies, this is good, but in this case, progress towards becoming an entirely lifeless and valueless corpse has only been delayed. The body can be looked at as a rubbish dump, disgusting and full of impurities. Uncreative people 
have no use for things they might find in such a dump. But an innovative person understands the value of recycling. He or she may take a dirty, smelly thing off the rubbish heap and clean it and be able to use it again. There are many stories of people who have made millions from the recycling business. From this rubbish heap we call our body, we can nonetheless extract gold through the practice of Dhamma. One form of gold is seal, purity of conduct, the ability to tame and civilize one's actions. After further extraction, the body yields up the controlling faculties of faith, mindfulness, effort, concentration, and wisdom. These are priceless jewels which can be extracted from the body through meditation. When the controlling faculties are well developed, the mind resists domination by greed hatred, and delusion. A person whose mind is free of these painful, oppressive qualities experiences an exquisite happiness and peace that cannot be bought with money. His or her presence becomes calm and sweet so that others feel uplifted. This inner freedom is independent of all circumstances and conditions and it is only available as a result of ardent meditation practice. Anyone can understand that painful mental states do not vanish just because we wish them to do so. Who has not wrestled with the desire they knew would hurt someone if they indulged in it. Is there anyone who has never been in an irritable, grumpy mood and wished they were feeling happy or contented instead? Has anyone failed to experience the pain of being confused? It is possible to uproot the tendencies which create pain and dissatisfaction in our lives. But for most of us, it is not easy. Spiritual work is as demanding as it is rewarding. Yet, we should not be discouraged. The goal and result of Vipassana meditation is to be free from all kinds, all shades, and all levels of mental and physical suffering. If you desire this kind of freedom, you should rejoice that you have an opportunity to strive to achieve it. The best time to strive is right now. If you are young, you should appreciate your good situation. For young people have the most energy to carry out the meditation practice. If you are older, you may have less physical energy, but perhaps you have seen enough of life to have gained wise consideration, such as a personal understanding of life's fleetingness and unpredictability. Urgency seized me. During the Buddha's time, there was a young bhikkhu or monk who had come from a wealthy family. Young and robust, he'd had the chance to enjoy a wide variety of sense pleasures before his ordination. 
He was wealthy. He had many friends and relatives, and his wealth made a, made available to him the full panoply of indulgences. Yet he renounced all this to seek liberation. One day, when the king of that country was reside, riding through the forest, he came across this monk. The king said, Venerable sir, you are young and robust. You are in the prime of your youth. You come from a wealthy family and have lots of opportunities to enjoy yourself. Why did you leave your home and family to wear robes and live in solitude? Don't you feel lonely? Aren't you bored? The monk answered, O oh, great king, when I was listening to the Buddha's discourse that leads to arousing spiritual urgency, a great sense of urgency seized me. I want to extract the optimum utility from this body of mine in time before I die. That is why I gave up the worldly life and took those robes. If you still are not convinced of the need to practice with great urgency, without attachment to body or life, the Buddha's words may also be helpful for you. One should reflect, he said, on the fact that the whole world of beings is made up of nothing but mind and matter, which have arisen, but do not stay. Mind and matter do not remain still for one single moment. They are in constant flux. Once we find ourselves in this body and mind, there is nothing we can do to prevent growth from taking place. When we are young, we like to grow. But when we are old, we are stuck in an irreversible process of decline. We like to be healthy, but our wishes can never be guaranteed. We are plagued by sickness and illnesses, by pain and discomfort throughout our existence. Immortal life is beyond our reach. All of us will die. Death is contrary to what we would wish for ourselves. Yet, we cannot prevent it. The only question is whether death will come sooner or later. Not a single person on earth can guarantee our wishes regarding growth, health, or immortality. People refuse to accept these facts. The old try to look young. Scientists develop all manner of cures and contraptions to delay the process of human decay. They even try to revive the dead. When we are sick, we take medi medications to feel better. But even if we get well, we will get sick again. Nature cannot be deceived. We cannot escape old age and death. This is the main weakness of beings. Beings are devoid of security. There is no safe refuge from old age disease and death. Look at other beings, look at animals, and most of all, look at yourself. If you have practiced deeply, these facts will come as no surprise to you. If you can see with intuitive insight how mental and physical phenomena arise endlessly from moment to moment, you know that there is no refuge anywhere that you can run to. 
there is no security. Yet, if your insight have not reached this point, perhaps reflecting on the precariousness of life will cause some urgency to arise in you and give you a strong impulse to practice. Vipassana meditation can lead to a place beyond all these fearsome things. Beings have another great weakness, lack of possessions. This may sound strange. We are born, we begin procuring knowledge right away. We obtain credentials. Most of us get a job and buy many items with the resulting wages. We call these our possessions. And on a relative level, that is what they are. No doubt about it. If possessions really belong to us, though, we would never be separated from them. Would they break or get lost or stolen the way they do if we own them in some other ultimate sense? When human beings die, there is nothing we can take with us. Everything gained, amassed, stored up and hoarded is left behind. Therefore, it is said that all beings are possession-less. All of our property must be left behind at the moment of death. Property is of three types. The first of which is immovable property, buildings, land, estates and so forth. Conventionally, these belong to you but you must leave them behind when you die. The second type of property is movable property. Chairs, toothbrushes and clothing, all the things you carry along as you travel about during your existence on this planet. Then there is knowledge, arts and sciences, the skills you use to sustain your life and that of others. As long as we have a body in good working order, this property of knowledge is essential. However, there is no insurance against losing that either. You may forget what you know, or you may be prevented from practicing your speciality by a government decree or some other unfortunate event. If you are a surgeon, you could badly break your arm or you could meet with some other kind of attack on your well-being, which leaves you too neurotic to continue your livelihood. None of these kinds of possessions can bring any security during existence on earth, let alone during the afterlife. If one can understand that we possess nothing and that life is extremely transitory, then we will feel much more peaceful when the inevitable comes to pass. Our only true possession. However, there are certain things that follow human beings through the doors of death. This is karma, the results of our actions. Our good and bad karmas follow us wherever we are. We cannot get away from them even if we want to. Believing that karma is your only true possession brings a strong wish to practice the Dhamma with ardor and thoroughness. You will understand that wholesome and beneficial deeds are an investment in your own future happiness and harmful deeds will rebound upon you. Thus, you will do many things based on noble considerations of 
benevolence, generosity, and kindness. You will try to make donations to hospitals to people suffering from calamity. You will support members of your family, the aged, the handicapped, and unprivileged, your friends, and other who need help. You will want to create a better society by maintaining purity of conduct, taming your speech and actions. You will bring about a peaceful environment as you strive to meditate and tame the obsessive glazes that arises in the heart. You will go through the stages of insight and eventually realize the ultimate goal. All of these meritorious deeds of dana, of giving, of sila, morality, and of bhavana, mental development of meditation, they will follow you after death, just as your shadow follows you wherever you go. Do not cease to cultivate the wholesome. All of us are slaves of craving. It is ignoble, but it is true. Desire is insatiable. As soon as we get something, we find it is not as satisfying as we thought it would be, and we try something else. It is the nature of life, like trying to scoop up water in a butterfly net. Beings cannot become contented by following the dictates of desire, chasing after objects. Desire can never satisfy desire. If we understand this truth correctly, we will not seek satisfaction in this self-defeating way. This is why the Buddha said that contentment is the greatest wealth. There is a story of a man who worked as a basket weaver. He was a simple man who enjoyed weaving his baskets. He whistled and sang and passed the day happily as he worked. At night, he retired at his little hut and slept well. One day, a wealthy man passed by and saw this poor, wretched basket weaver. He was filled with compassion and gave him thousand dollars. Take this, he said, and go enjoy yourself. The basket weaver took the money with much appreciation. He had never seen a thousand dollars in his life. He took it back to his ramshackle hut and was wondering where he could keep it. But his hut was not very secure. He could not sleep all night because he was worrying about robbers or even rats nibbling at his cash. The next day, he took his thousand dollars to work. But he did not sing or whistle because he was worrying so much about his money again. Once more that night, he did not sleep, and in the morning, he returned the thousand dollars to the wealthy man, saying, Give me back my happiness. You may think that Buddhism discourages you from seeking knowledge, or credentials, or from working hard to earn money, 
so you can support yourself and family and friends and contribute to worthy cause and institutions. No, by all means, make use of your life and your intelligence and obtain all these things legally and honestly. The point is to be contented with what you have. Do not become a slave of craving. That is the message. Reflect on the weaknesses of beings so that you can get the most from your body and life before you are too sick and old to practice and can only depart from this useless corpse. 8. Patience and Perseverance if you practice with heroic effort, entertaining no considerate attachment to your body or life, you can develop the liberating energy which will carry you through the higher stages of practice. Such a courageous attitude contains within itself not only the seventh but also the Eighth means of developing the controlling faculties. This eighth quality is patience and perseverance in dealing with pain, especially painful sensations in the body. All yogis are familiar with the unpleasant sensations that come up during the course of a single sitting. The suffering of the mind in reaction to these sensations and on top of that the mind's resistance to being controlled as it must be in the practice. An hour's sitting requires a lot of work. First you try to keep your mind on the primary object as much as possible. This restraint and control can be very threatening to the mind, accustomed as it is to running wild. The process of maintaining attention becomes a strain. The strain of the mind resisting control is one form of suffering. When the mind fills with resistance, often the body reacts also. Tension arises. In a short time, you are besieged by painful sensations. What with the initial resistance and this pain on top of it, you have got quite a task on your hands. Your mind is constricted. Your body is tight. You lose the patience to look directly at the physical pain. Now your mind goes completely bonkers. It may fill with aversion and rage. Your suffering is now threefold. The mind's initial resistance the actual physical pain and the mental suffering that results from physical suffering. This would be a good time to apply the eighth cause of strengthening the controlling faculties. Patience and perseverance and try to look at the pain directly. If you are not prepared to confront pain in a patient way, you only leave open the door to the kilesas, like greed and anger. Oh, I hate this pain. If only I could get back the wonderful comfort I had five minutes ago. In the presence of anger and greed, and in the absence of patience, the mind becomes confused and diluted as well. Know 
object is clear and you are unable to see the true nature of pain. At such a time, you will believe that pain is a thorn, a hindrance in your practice. You may decide to shift position in order to concentrate better. If such movement becomes a habit, you will lose the chance to deepen your meditation practice. Calmness and tranquility of mind have their foundations in stillness of body. Constant movement is actually a good way to conceal the true nature of pain. Pain may be right under your nose the most predominant element of your experience. But you move your body so as not to look at it. You lose a wonderful opportunity to understand what pain really is. In fact, we have been living with pain ever since we were born on this planet. It has been close to us all our lives. Why do we run from it? If pain arises, look on it as a precious opportunity really to understand something familiar in a new and deeper way. At times, when you are not meditating, you can exercise patience toward painful sensations, especially if you are concentrating on something you are interested in. Say you are a person who really loves game of chess. You sit in your chair and look very intently at the chessboard, where your opponent has just made a fantastic move putting you in check. You may have been sitting on that chair for two hours, yet you will not feel your cramped positions as you try to work out the strategy to escape from your predicament. Your mind is totally lost in thought. If you do feel a pain, you may very well ignore it until you have achieved your goal. It is even more important to exercise patience in the practice of meditation, which develops a much higher level of wisdom than does chess, and which get us out of a more fundamental kind of predicament. Strategies for Dealing with Pain The degree of penetration into the true nature of phenomena depends very much on the level of concentration we can develop. The more one-pointed the mind, the more deeply it can penetrate and understand reality. This is particularly true when one is being aware of painful sensations. If concentration is weak, we will not really feel the discomfort which is always present in our bodies. When concentration begins to deepen, even the slightest discomfort becomes so very clear that it appears to be magnified and exaggerated. Most human beings are myopic in this sense. Without the eyeglasses of concentration, the world appears hazy, blurry and indistinct. But when we put them on, all is bright and clear. It is not the objects that have changed. It is the acuity of our sight. 
When you look with the naked eye at a drop of water, you do not see much. If you put a sample under the microscope, however, you begin to see many things happening there. Many things are dancing and moving, fascinating to watch. If in meditation you are able to put on your glasses of concentration, you will be surprised at the variety of changes taking place in what would appear to be stagnant and uninteresting spot of pain. The deeper the concentration, the deeper your understanding of pain. You will be more and more enthralled the more clearly you can see that the painful sensations are in a constant state of flux. From one sensation to another, changing, diminishing, growing stronger, fluctuating and dancing. Concentration and mindfulness will deepen and sharpen at times when the show becomes utterly fascinating, there is a sudden and unexpected end to it, as though the curtain is dropped and the pain just disappears miraculously. One who is unable to arouse enough courage or energy to look at pain will never understand the potential that lies in it. We have to develop courage of mind, heroic effort to look at pain. Let's learn not to run away from pain, but rather to go right in. When pain arises, the first strategy is to send your attention straight towards it right to the center of it. You try to penetrate its core. Seeing the pain as pain, note it persistently, trying to get under its surface so that you do not react. Perhaps you try very hard, but you still become fatigued Pain can exhaust the mind. If you cannot maintain a reasonable level of energy, mindfulness and concentration, it is time to gracefully withdraw. The second strategy for dealing with pain is to play with it. You go into it and then you relax a bit. You keep your attention on the pain but you loosen the intensity of mindfulness and concentration. This gives your mind a rest. Then you go in again as closely as you can. And if you are not successful, you retreat again. You go in and out back and forth, two or three times. If the pain is still strong and you find your mind becoming tight and constricted despite these tactics, it is time for a graceful surrender. This does not mean shifting your physical position just yet. It means shifting the position of your mindfulness. Completely ignore the pain and put your mind on the rising and falling or whatever primary object you are using. Try to concentrate so strongly on this that the pain is blocked out of your awareness. Healing Body and Mind We must try to overcome any timidity of mind. Only if you have the strength of mind 
of a hero will you be able to overcome pain by understanding it for what it really is. In meditation, many kinds of unbearable physical sensations can arise. Nearly all yogis see clearly the discomfort that has always existed in their bodies, but magnified by concentration. During intensive practice, pain also frequently resurfaces from old wounds, childhood mishaps, or chronic illnesses of the past. A current or recent illness can suddenly get worse. If these last two happen to you, you can say that Lady Luck is on your side. You have the chance to overcome the illness or chronic pain through your own heroic effort without taking a drop of medicine. Many yogis have totally overcome and transcended their health problems through meditation practice alone. About 15 years ago, there was a man who would be in suffering from gastric troubles for many years. When he went to his checkup, the doctor said he had a tumor and needed surgery. The man was afraid that the operation would be unsuccessful and he might die. So he decided to play it safe in case he did die. I had better go meditate, he said to himself. He came to practice under my guidance. So he began to feel a lot of pain. At first, it was not bad. But as he made progress in practice and reached the level of insight connected with pain, he had a severe, unbearable, torturous attack. He told me about it and I said, Of course, you are free to go home to see your doctor. However, why don't you stay a few more days? He thought about it and decided there still was no guarantee he would survive the operation. So he decided to stay and meditate. He took a teaspoonful of medicine every two hours. At times the pain got the better of him. At times he overcame the pain. It was a long battle with losses on both sides. But this man had enormous courage. During one sitting, the pain was so excruciating that his whole body shook and his clothes were soaked in sweat. The tumor in his stomach was getting harder and harder more and more constricted. Suddenly, his idea of his stomach disappeared as he was looking at it. Now, there was just his consciousness and a painful object. It was very painful, but it was very interesting. He kept on watching and there was just noting mind and the pain, which got more and more excruciating. Then there was a big explosion like a bomb. The yogi said he could even hear a loud sound. After that it was all over, he got up from his sitting, drenched in sweat. He touched his belly, but... In the place where his tumor once protruded, there was nothing. He was completely cured. Moreover, 
he had completed his meditation practice, having had an insight into Nibbana. Soon after this man left the center and I asked him to let me know what the doctor said about the gastric problem. The doctor was shocked to see that the tumor was gone. The man could forget the strict diet he had followed for 20 years. And to this day, he is alive and in good health. Even the doctor became a Vipassana yogi. I have come across innumerable people who have recovered from chronic headaches, heart trouble, tuberculosis, even cancer, and severe injuries sustained at an early age. Some of them had been declared incurable by doctors. All of these people had to go through tremendous pain, but they exercised enormous perseverance and courageous effort, and they healed themselves. More important, many also came to understand far more deeply the truth about reality by observing pain with tenacious courage and then breaking through to insight. You should not be discouraged by painful sensations. Rather, have faith and patience. Persevere until you understand your own true nature. 9. Unwavering Commitment The ninth and last factor leading to the development of controlling faculties is the quality of mind that keeps you walking straight to the end of the path without becoming sidetracked, without giving up your task. What is your objective in practicing meditation? Why do you undergo the threefold training of Sila, Samadhi and Panya? It is important to appreciate the goal of meditation practice. It is even more important to be honest with yourself so that you can know the extent of your commitment to the goal. Good deeds and our highest potential. Let us reflect on Sila. Having this amazing opportunity to be born on this planet as human beings, understanding that our wondrous existence in this world comes about as a result of good deeds, we should endeavor to live up to the highest potential of humanity. The positive connotations of the word humanity are great loving kindness and compassion. Would it not be proper for every human being on the planet to aspire to be perfect in these qualities? If one is able to cultivate a mind filled with compassion and loving kindness, it is easy to live in a harmonious and wholesome way. Morality is based on consideration for the feelings of all beings, others as well as oneself. One behaves in a moral way not only to be harmless towards others, but also to prevent one's own future sorrow. We all should avoid actions that will lead to unfavorable consequences and walk the path of wholesome actions, which can free us 
forever from states of misery. Kamma is our only true property. It will be very helpful if you can take this view as a basic foundation for your behavior. For your practice, for your life as a whole, whether good or bad, karma follows us everywhere, in this life and the next. If we perform skillful, harmonious actions, we will be held in high esteem in this very life. Wise persons will praise us and hold us in affection. And we will also be able to look forward to good circumstances in our future lives until we attain final Nibbana. Committing bad or unskillful actions brings about dishonor and notoriety even in this life. Wise people will blame us and look down upon us. No, in the future will we be able to escape the consequences of our bad deeds. In its powerful potential to bring good and bad results, karma can be compared to food. Some food are suitable and healthy, while others are poisonous to the body. If we understand which foods are nutritious, eating them at the proper time and in proper amounts, we can enjoy a long and healthy life. If, on the other hand, we are tempted by foods which are unhealthy and poisonous, we must suffer the consequences. We may fall sick and suffer a great deal. We may even die. Beautiful Acts Practicing dana or generosity can lessen the greed that arises in the heart. The five basic sealer precepts help control the emotions and very gross defilements of greed and hatred. Observing the precepts, the mind is controlled to the extent that it does not manifest through the body and perhaps not even through speech. If you can be perfect in precepts, you may appear to be a very holy person, but instead you may still be tortured by eruptions of impatience, hatred, covetousness, and scheming. Therefore, the next step is bhavana, which means in Pali the cultivation of exceptionally wholesome mental states. The first part of bhavana is to prevent unwholesome states from arising. The second part is the development of wisdom in the absence of these states. Blissful concentration and its flows. Samatha bhavana or concentration meditation has the power to make the mind calm and tranquil and to pull it far away from the kilesas. It suppresses the kilesas, making it impossible for them to attack. Samatha Bhavana is not unique to Buddhism. It can be found in many other religious systems, particularly in Hindu practices. It is a commandable undertaking in which the practitioner achieves purity of mind during the time he or she is absorbed in the object of meditation. 
profound bliss, happiness, and tranquility are achieved. At times, even psychic powers can be cultivated through these states. However, Success in Samatha Bhavana does not at all mean that one gains an insight into the true nature of reality in terms of mind and matter. The kilesas have been suppressed but not uprooted. The mind has not yet penetrated the true nature of reality. Thus, practitioners are not freed from the net of samsara and they even fall into states of misery in the future. One can attain a great deal through concentration and yet still be a loser. After the Buddha's supreme enlightenment, he spent 49 days in Bodh Gaya, enjoying the bliss of his liberation. Then he started to think about how he could communicate this profound and subtle truth to other beings. He looked around and saw that most of the world was covered by a thick layer of dust of kilesas. People were wallowing in deepest darkness. The immensity of his task dawned on him. Then it occurred to him that there were two people who would be quite receptive to his teaching whose minds were quite pure and clear of the kilesas. In fact, they were two of his former teachers, the hermit Alara and Kalama, and Uddhaka the Ramaputta. Each of them had a large number of followers due to their attainments in concentration. The Buddha had mastered each of their teachings in turn, but had realized that he was seeking something beyond what they taught. Yet, both of these hermits' minds were very pure. Alara the Kalama had mastered the seventh level of concentration and Uddhaka the Ramaputta, the eighth, or highest level of absorption. The kilesas were kept far from them, even during the times when they were not actually practicing their absorptions. The Buddha felt certain they would become completely enlightened if, the, if only he would speak a few significant words of Dhamma to them. Even the Buddha considered in this way an invisible Deva, a being from a celestial realm, announced to him that both of the hermits have died. Alara, the Kalama, had passed away seven days before. The Uddhaka, the Ramaputta, only the previous night. Both had been reborn in the formless world of the Brahmas, where mind exists but matter does not. Therefore, the hermits no longer had ears for hearing, nor eyes for seeing. It was impossible for them to see the Buddha or to listen to the Dhamma. And since meeting with the teacher 
and listening to Dhamma are the only two ways to discover the right way of practice. The two hermits had missed their chance to become fully enlightened. The Buddha was moved. They have suffered a great loss, he said. Liberating Intuition What exactly is missing from concentration meditation? It simply cannot bring the understanding of truth. For this, we need vipassana meditation. Only intuitive insight into the true nature of the mind and matter can free one from the concept of ego, of a person, of self, or I. Without this insight, which comes about through the process of bare awareness, one cannot be free from these concepts. Only an intuitive understanding of the mechanism of cause and effect, that is, seeing the link of recurrence of mind and matter, can free one from the delusion that things happen without a cause. Only by seeing the rapid arising and disappearance of phenomena can one be released from the delusion that things are permanent, solid and continuous. Only by experiencing suffering in the same intuitive way can one deeply learn that samsaric existence is not worth clinging to. Only the knowledge that mind and matter just flow by according to their own natural laws with no one and nothing behind them can impress upon one's mind there is no atta or self-essence. Unless you go through the various levels of insight and eventually realize Nibbana, you will not understand true happiness. With Nibbana as the ultimate goal of your practice, you should try to maintain a high level of energy, not stopping or surrendering, never retreating until you reach your final destination. First, you will make the effort needed to establish your meditation practice. You focus your mind on the primary object of meditation and you return to this object again and again. You set up a routine of sitting and walking practice. This is called launching energy. It puts you on the path and gets you moving forward. Even if obstacles arise, you will stick with your practice, overcoming all obstacles with perseverance. If you are bored and lethargic, you summon up ardent energy. If you feel pain, you overcome the timid mind that prefers to withdraw and is unwilling to face what is happening. This is called liberating energy. The energy necessary to liberate you from indolence. You will not retreat. You know you will just keep walking until you reach your goal. After that, when you have overcome the intermediate difficulties and perhaps have found yourself in a smooth and subtle space, you will not be complacent. You will go into the next gear. 
putting in the effort to lift your mind higher and higher. This is an effort which neither decreases nor stagnates, but is in constant progress. This is called progressive effort and it leads to the goal you desire. Therefore, the ninth factor conducing to sharpening the controlling faculties actually means applying successive levels of energy so that you neither stop nor hesitate, surrender nor retreat. Until you realize and reach your final goal and destination. As you go along in this way, making use of all the nine qualities of mind described above, the five controlling faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom will sharpen and deepen. Eventually, they will take over your mind and lead you on to freedom. I hope you can examine your own practice. If you see that it is lacking in some element, make use of the above information to your own benefit. Please walk straight on until you reach your desired goal. Chapter 3 The Ten Armies of Mara Meditation can be seen as a war between wholesome and unwholesome mental states. On the unwholesome side are the forces of the Kilesas, also known as the Ten Armies of Mara. In Pali, Mara means killer. He is the personification of the force that kills virtue and also kills existence. His armies are poised to attack all yogis. They even tried to overcome the Buddha on the night of his enlightenment. Here are the lines the Buddha addressed to Mara as recorded in the Sutta Nipata. Sensual pleasures are your first army. Discontent, your second is called. Your third is hunger and thirst. The fourth is called craving. Sloth and Topher are your fifth. The sixth is called Fear. Your seventh is Doubt. 
conceit and ingratitude are your eight. Gain, renown, honor, and whatever fame is falsely received are the ninth. And whoever both extols himself and disparges others has fallen victim to the tenth. That is your army, Namuchi, means Mara, the striking force of darkness. One who is not a hero cannot conquer it, but having conquered it, one obtains happiness. To overcome the forces of darkness, in our own minds, we have the wholesome power of Satipatthana Vipassana meditation, which gives us the sword of mindfulness as well as strategies for attack and defense. In the Buddha's case, we know who won the victory. Now, which side will win over you? First army, sense pleasure. Sense pleasure is the first army of Mara. Due to previous good actions in sensual or material realms, we find ourselves reborn in this world. Here, as in other sensual spheres, Beings are faced with the wide assortment of appealing sense objects. Sweet sounds, rich smells, beautiful ideas and other delightful objects touch all our six sense doors. As a natural result of encountering these objects, desires arise. Pleasant objects and desire are the two bases of sense pleasure. Our attachments to family, property, business and friends also constitute the first army. Normally for a sentient being, this army is very difficult to overcome. Some humans fight it by becoming monks and nuns, leaving behind their families and all that they cling to. Yogis on retreat leave behind their family and occupation temporarily in order to combat the force of attachment which ties us to the six kinds of sense objects. Anytime you practice meditation, especially in a retreat, you leave behind a large number of pleasant things. Even with this narrowing in range, though, you still find that some parts of your environment are more desirable than others. At this time, it is useful to recognize that you are dealing with Mara, the enemy of your freedom. Second army, dissatisfaction. The second army of Mara is dissatisfaction with the holy life, with the meditation practice in particular. On a retreat, you may find yourself dissatisfied and bored with the hardness or the height of your cushion with the food you are given. With any of the elements of your life during the time of practice. Some issues crops up and as a result you cannot quite immerse yourself in the delight of meditation. 
you may begin to feel that this is actually the fault of the practice. To combat this discontent, you must become an abhirati, a person who is delighted in and devoted to the Dhamma. Having found and implemented the correct method of practice, you begin to overcome the hindrances. Rapture, joy and comfort will arise naturally from your concentrated mind. At this time, you realize that the delight of the Dhamma is far superior to sense pleasures. This is the attitude of an Abhirati. However, if you are not thorough and careful in your practice, you will not find this subtle and wonderful taste of the Dhamma and any difficulty in your practice will cause aversion to arise in you. Then Mara will be victorious. The overcoming of difficulty in Vipassana practice is, again, like warfare. The yogi will use an offensive, defensive, or a guerrilla style of combat depending on his or her abilities. If he or she is a strong fighter, the yogi will advance. If weak, he or she may withdraw temporarily. But not in a helter-skelter fashion. Reeling and running in disorder. Rather, the withdrawal will be strategic, planned and executed with the aim of gathering strength to win the battle at last. Sometimes discontent with the environment or other supports of meditation practice is not entirely Mara's fault, not entirely due to the wanderings of the greedy mind. Nonetheless, pervasive discontent may interfere with the meditative progress. To allow for meditation, certain necessities of life must be available. Yogis must have proper shelter and meals, as well as sundry other help. With these requirements met, they can proceed wholeheartedly to practice meditation. The need for a subtle environment is the fourth of nine causes for development of the controlling faculties and was discussed at length in the preceding chapter. If you find a deficiency in your environment that you are certain is hindering your meditation, it is all right to take reasonable steps to correct it. Of course, you should be honest with yourself and others. Make sure that you are not merely succumbing to Mara's second army. Third army, hunger and thirst. Is food the problem? Perhaps a yogi has to overcome desire and dissatisfaction, only to be attacked again by Mara's third army, hunger and thirst. In the days of old and even now, Buddhist monks and nuns have depended for their food 
on the generosity of lay people. The normal practice for a monk is to go for an alms round every day in the community or village that supports him. Sometimes a monk may live in a secluded area and take all his support from a small group of families. One day his needs will be well taken care of. Another day not. The same goes for lay yogis. At a retreat, the food is not quite like home. You do not get the sweet things you are fond of, or the sour, salty and rich foods you are accustomed to. Agitated by missing such tastes, you cannot concentrate and thus are unable to see the Dhamma. In the world also, one can spend a lot of money in a restaurant and then not like the dish. Rarely, in fact, do human beings get everything precisely as they like. They may hunger and thirst not only for food, but also for clothing, entertainment, and activities either reassuringly familiar or exotically exciting. This notion of hunger and thirst relates to the entire range of needs and requirements. If you are easily contented, adopting an attitude of being grateful for whatever you receive, Mara's third army will not bother you very much. One cannot always do everything one wishes to do. But it is possible to try to remain within what is beneficial and appropriate. If you concentrate your energy on furthering your meditation practice, you will be able to taste the real taste of Dhamma, which is incomparably satisfying. At such a time, the third army of Mara will seem an army of toy soldiers to you. Otherwise, it is hard to adjust to hunger and thirst. They are uncomfortable feelings which no one really welcomes. When they strike, if there is no mindfulness, the mind inevitably begins to scheme you come up with fantastic justifications for getting what you want for the sake of your practice, your mental health, to aid your digestion. Then you begin moving around to get the things you desire. Your body gets involved in satisfying your cravings. Fourth Army Craving Craving is the fourth army of Mara. At times, a monk bowl may not be quite full at the ends of his normal arms round, or some of the things more suitable for his diet have not yet appeared in it. Instead of going home to the monastery, he may decide to continue his arms round. Here is a new route, as yet untried. On it, he might get the tidbit he desires. New routes like this can grow quite long. Whether one is a monk or not, one might be familiar with this pattern. First comes craving then planning, then moving about to materialize these schemes. This whole process can be very exhausting to the mind and body. 
fifth army sloth and topper thus the fifth army of mara marches in it is none other than sloth and topper drowsiness the difficulties caused by sloth and torpor are worth dwelling on for they are surprisingly great torpor is the unusual translation of the pali word thina which actually means a weak mind a shrunken and withered vicious and slimy mind unable to grasp the meditation object firmly as thena makes the mind weak it automatically brings on weakness of body the sluggish mind cannot keep your sitting posture erect and firm walking meditation becomes a real drag so to speak the presence of thena means that atapa o fiery aspect of energy is absent the mind becomes stiff and hard it loses its active sharpness even if a yogi has good energy to begin with sloth can envelop him or her so that an additional burst of energy will be required to burn it away all the positive forces of mind are at least partially blocked the wholesome factors of energy and mindfulness aims and contact are enveloped in the shroud of weakness their functions are retarded this situation as a whole is spoken of as thena midda thena being the mental factor of torpor and midda referring to the condition of the consciousness as a whole when the factor of torpor is present in one's practical experience it is not worthwhile to try to distinguish between the two components of thena and midda the general state of mind is familiar enough like imprisonment in a tiny cell sloth is a restricted state in which no wholesome factor is free to carry on its proper activity this obstruction of wholesome factors is why sloth and torpor together are called a hindrance eventually mara's fifth army can bring one's practice to a complete standstill a twitching sensation comes to the eyelids the head suddenly nods forward how can we overcome this nauseous state once when the venerable maha moggallana one of the buddha's two chief disciples was meditating in the forest thena midda arose his mind shrank and withered and unworkable as a piece of butter that hardens in the cold at this point the lord buddha looked into the venerable maha moggallana's mind seeing his plight he approached and said my son maha moggallana are you drowsy are you sleepy are you nodding the elder replied yes lord i am nodding he was frank and candid in his reply listen my son the buddha said i will now teach you eight techniques to overcome sloth and torpor 
8 ways to stay awake. The first is to change one's attitude. When torpor attacks, one may be tempted to surrender to thoughts like, I am so sleepy, it's not doing me any good just to sit here and daze. Maybe I'll lie down for a minute and gather my energy. As long as you entertain such thoughts, the mental state of sloth and torpor will be encouraging to remain. If, on the other hand, one states decisively, I'll sit through this sloth and torpor, and if it recurs, I still won't give it give in to it. This is what the Buddha meant by changing one's attitude. Such determination sets the stage for overcoming the first army of Mara. Another occasion to change one's attitude is when meditation practice becomes quite easy and smooth. There comes a point where you have more or less mastered following the rise and fall of the abdomen and not much effort is needed to observe it well. It is quite natural to relax, sit back and watch the movement very coolly. Due to this relaxation of effort, sloth and torpor easily creep in. If this happens, you should either try to deepen your mindfulness, looking more carefully into the rise and fall, or else increase the number of objects of meditation. This is a specific technique for adding more objects. It requires greater effort than simply watching the abdomen, and thus, it has a revivifying effect. The mental labels to use are rising, falling, sitting, touching. When you note sitting, you shift your awareness from the sensation of the entire body in the sitting posture. Noting touching, you focus on the touch sensations at one or more small areas about the size of a quarter. The buttocks are convenient. During this touching, note you should always return to the same chosen areas, even if you cannot always find sensations there. The heavier the state of sloth, the more touch points you should include, up to a maximum of six or so. When you have run through the course of touch points, return attention to your abdomen and repeat the series of notes from the beginning. This change of strategy can be quite effective, but it is not infallible. The second anecdote to drowsiness is to reflect on inspirational passages you remember or have learned by heart. Trying to fathom these deepest meanings. Trying to fathom their deepest meanings. Perhaps you have lain awake at night pondering the meaning of some event. If so, you understand the functions of Buddha's second anecdote to sloth and torpor. In Buddhist psychology, when thinking is analyzed in terms of its components, one component is the mental factor of vitakka or aim. This mental factor has the capacity to open 
and refresh the mind and is to and is the specific anecdote to sloth and to offer the third strategy for dealing with sloth is to recite those same passages aloud if you are meditating in a group it goes without saying that you should recite only loud enough for your own benefit resort to more drastic measures if your mind still has not perked up pull on your ears rub your hands arms legs and face this stimulates the circulation and so freshens you up a bit if drowsiness still persists get up mindfully and wash your face you could put in some eye drops to refresh yourself if this strategy also fails you are advised to look at the lighted object such as a moon or an electric bulb this should lighten up your mind clarity of mind is a kind of light with it you can make a renewed attempt to look clearly at the rising and falling from beginning to end if, if none of these techniques work then you should try to some brisk walking meditation with mindfulness finally a graceful surrender would be to go to bed if sloth and torpor are persistent over a long period constipation could be responsible if this is the case consider measures to gently clear the bowels sixth army fear the sixth army of mara is fear and cowardliness it easily attacks yogis who practice in a remote place especially if the level of ardent effort is low after an attack of sloth and torpor courageous effort drives out fear so does a clear perception of the dhamma which comes as a result of effort mindfulness and concentration the dhamma is the greatest protection available on earth faith in and practice of the dhamma are therefore the greatest medicines for fear practicing morality ensures that one's future circumstances will be wholesome and pleasant practice in concentration means that one suffers less from mental distress and practicing wisdom leads towards nibbana where all fear and danger have been surpassed practicing the dhamma you truly care for yourself protect yourself and act as your own best friend ordinary fear is the sinking form of anger you cannot face problem so you show no reaction outwardly and wait for the opportunity to run away but if you can face your problems directly with an open and relaxed mind fear will not arise on a meditation retreat yogis who have lost touch with the dhamma feel fear and lack of confidence in relating to other yogis and their teacher for example some yogis are severely attacked by sloth and torpor such people 
have been known to sleep through five hour long sittings in a row. They may have only a few minutes of clear awareness in an early, entire day. Such yogis tend to feel inferior, shy and embarrassed, especially if they begin to compare their own practice to that of other yogis who seems to be in deep samadhi all the time. At times in Burma, torpid yogis slip away for a couple of days and miss their interviews. A few slip all the way home. They are like school children who have not done their homework. If such yogis would apply courageous effort, their awareness would become hot like the sun, burning off the clouds of sleepiness. Then they could face their teacher boldly, ready to report what they have seen for themselves in the light created by Dhamma practice. No matter what problem you may encounter in your meditation practice, try to have the courage and honesty to report it to your teacher. Sometimes yogis may feel that their practice is falling apart when actually it is going fine. A teacher who is trustworthy and well qualified can help you to overcome such insecurities and you can continue on the path of Dhamma with energy, faith and confidence. Seventh Army Doubt Sloth and torpor is only one reason why yogis may begin to doubt their own capacities. Doubt is the seventh army of Mara, dreadful and fearsome. When a yogi begins to slip in his or her practice, he or she will probably begin to lose self-confidence. Pondering the situation does not usually lead to improvement. Instead, doubt arises and slowly spreads, first as self-doubt, then as doubt of the method of practice. It may even extend to becoming doubt of the teacher. Is the teacher competent to understand this situation? Perhaps this yogi is a special case and needs a special new set of instructions. The experiences narrated by the fellow yogis must be imaginary. Every conceivable aspect of practice becomes dubious. The Pali word for the seventh army is vichikicha, which means more than simple doubt. It is the exhaustion of mind that comes about through conjecture. A yogi attacked by sloth and torpor, for example, will not be able to muster the continuous attention that fosters intuitive vipassana insight. If such a yogi were mindful, he or she might experience mind and matter directly and see that these two are connected by cause and effect. If no actual observation is made, However, the true nature of mind and matter will remain obscure. One simply cannot understand what one hasn't yet seen. Now, this unmindful yogi begins to intellectualize the reason. 
I wonder what mind and matter are composed of, what their relationship is. Unfortunately, he or she can only interpret experiences based on a very immature depth of knowledge, mixed up with fantasy. This is an explosive mixture. Since the mind is unable to penetrate into the truth, agitation arises, and then perplexity, indecisiveness, which is another aspect of vichikicca. Excessive reasoning is exhausting. Immaturity of insight prevents a yogi from reaching a firm and convinced position. Instead, his or her mind is condemned to run about among various options. Remembering all the meditative techniques he or she has heard of, a yogi might try a bit from here and a bit from there. This person falls into a great pot of chop suey, perhaps to drown. Vichikicca can be a terrible obstacle in practice. The proximate cause of doubting conjecture is lack of proper attention and improper adjustment of the mind in its search, the search for the truth. Proper attention, then, is the most direct cure for doubt. If you look correctly and in the right place, you will see what you are looking for. The true nature of things. Having seen this for yourself, you will have no more doubt about it. To create the proper conditions for wise attention, it is important to have a teacher who can put you on the path leading to truth and wisdom. The Buddha himself said that one who is intent on finding the truth should seek out a reliable and competent teacher. If you cannot find a good teacher and follow his or her instructions, then you must turn to the plethora of meditation literature available today. Please be cautious, especially if you are an avid reader. If you gain a general knowledge of many techniques and then Try to put them all together. You will probably end up disappointed and even more doubtful than when you started. Some of the techniques may even be good ones, but since you will not have practiced them with proper thoroughness, they will not work and you will feel skeptical of them. Thus, you will have robbed yourself of opportunity to experience the very real benefits of meditation practice. If one cannot practice properly, one cannot gain personal, intuitive, real understanding of the nature of phenomena. Not only will doubt increase, but the mind will become very hard and stiff, attacked by crowther, aversion and associated mental states. Frustration and resistance might be among them. The thorny mind. Crowther makes the mind hard and rigid as a thorn. Under its influence, a yogi is said to be pricked by the mind, like a traveler thrashing through a 
Bramble Thicket, Suffering at Every Step. Since Kodha is a great impediment in many yogis meditation practice, I will deal with it in some detail in hopes that readers can learn to overcome it. In general, it results from two kinds of mental states. Firstly, from doubt and secondly, from what are known as the mental fetters. There are five kinds of doubt which lead to the thorny mind. A yogi is pricked by doubt regarding the Buddha, the great master who showed the path to enlightenment. One doubts the Dhamma, the path that leads to liberation, and the Sangha, the noble ones who have uprooted some or all the kilesas. Next come doubts of oneself, of one's own mortality and method of practice. Last is doubt of fellow yogis, including one's teacher. When so many doubts are present, the yogi is filled with anger and resistance. His or her mind becomes thorny indeed. He or she will probably feel quite unwilling actually to practice this meditation, seeing it as dubious and unreliable. All is not lost, however. Wisdom and knowledge are medicine for this state of vichikicca. One form of knowledge is reasoning. Often, persuasive words can coax a doubting yogi from the brambles, a teacher's reasoning or an inspiring and well-constructed discourse. Returning to the clear path of direct observation, such yogis breathe great sigh of relief and gratitude. Now they have the chance to gain personal insight into the nature of reality. If they do attain insight, then a higher level of wisdom becomes their medicine for the thorny mind. Failure to return to the path, however, may allow doubt to reach its incurable stage. The five mental fetters. The thorny mind arises not only from doubt, but also from another set of causes known as the five mental fetters. When these mental fetters are present, the mind suffers from hard and pricking states of aversion, frustration and resistance. But these fetters can be overcome. Vipassana meditation clears them automatically from the mind. If they do manage to intrude upon one's practice, identifying them is the first step towards recovering a broad and flexible mental state. The first mental fetter is to be chained to the various objects of the senses. Desiring only pleasant objects, one will be dissatisfied with what is really occurring in the present moment. The primary object, the rising and falling of the abdomen, may seem inadequate and uninteresting in comparison with one's fantasies. If this dissatisfaction occurs, one's meditative development 
will be undermined. The second fetter is over-attachment to one's own body. Sometimes spoken of as excessive self-love. A variation is the projection of attachment and possessiveness onto another person and his or her body. This is the third fetter. And it is such a common situation that I hardly need to elaborate. Excessive self-love can be a significant hindrance in the course of practice. When one sits for extended periods, unpleasant sensations invariably arise. Some of them rather intense. You may begin to wonder about your poor legs. Will you ever walk again? You may decide to open your eyes and stretch. At this point, continuity of attention usually breaks apart. Momentum is lost. Tender consideration for one's own body can sometimes supplant the courage we need to probe into the actual nature of pain. Personal appearance is another area where this second fetter can arise. Some human beings depend on stylish clothes and makeup to feel happy. If ever, they lose access to these external supports, perhaps on a retreat where makeup and flamboyant fashions are inappropriate distractions. These people feel as if something is missing and worry can interfere with their progress. The fourth fetter of the mind is to be chained to food. Some people like to eat large amounts. Others have many whims and preferences. People whose first concern is the satisfaction of their bellies tend to find greater bliss in snoozing than in practicing mindfulness. A few yogis have the opposite problem, worrying constantly about gaining weight. They too are chained to what they eat. The fifth fetter of mind is to practice with the goal of gaining rebirth in a deva world. Besides effectively basing one's practice on craving for sensual pleasures, this is also to set one's sights much too low. For information on the disadvantages of deva life, see the last chapter of this book, Chariot to Nibbana. By diligent practice, one overcomes these five fetters. By the same means, one overcomes doubt and the anger that follows it. Relieved from thorny discomfort, the mind becomes crystal clear and bright. This bright mind is happy to make the preliminary effort that sets your feet on the path of practice. The steady effort that moves you along into deeper meditation and the culmination of effort that brings liberation at the higher stages of practice. This threefold effort, actually directed towards keeping the mind alert and observant, is the best and most natural defensive strategy against Mara's seventh army of doubt. Only when the mind slips from this object, as it will in times of slackening effort, do the conjectures of doubt have a chance to set in.
faith clarifies the mind. The quality of faith or sadha also has the power to clarify the mind and clear away clouds of doubt or aversion. Imagine a pile of murky river water full of sediment. Some chemical substances such as alum have the power to make suspended particles settle quickly, leaving clear water behind. Faith works just like this. It settles impurities and brings a sparkling clarity to the mind. A yogi ignorant of the virtues of the triple gem, the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha will doubt its value as well as that of the meditation practice and will be overcome by the seventh army of Mara. Such a yogi's mind is like a bucket of murky river water. But informed of these virtues through reading, discussions and Dhamma talks, a yogi can gradually settle doubts and begin to arouse faith. With faith comes the desire to meditate, the willingness to exert energy in order to reach the goal. Strong faith is the foundation of sincerity and commitment. Sincerity of practice and commitment of the Dhamma will of course lead to the development of effort, mindfulness and concentration. Then wisdom will unfold in the form of the various stages of vipassana insight. When circumstances and conditions are right in meditation, wisdom unfolds quite naturally of itself. Wisdom or insight occurs when one sees the specific and common characteristics of mental and physical phenomena. Individual characteristics mean the specific traits of mind and matter as experienced directly within you. These are color, shape, taste, smell, loudness, hardness or softness, temperature, moment and different states of mind. Common characteristics are general to all the manifestations of mind and matter. Objects may differ greatly from one another in terms of individual essence or individual characteristics, yet all are united by the universal traits of impermanence, suffering, and absence of an abiding self or essence. Both these types of characteristics, specific and common, will be understood clearly and unquestionably through the inside that arises naturally out of their awareness. One attribute of this wisdom or insight is the quality of brightness. It lightens one's field of awareness. Wisdom is like a floodlight breaking into pitch darkness, revealing what was visible up to now. The specific and common qualities of all objects and mental states. By wisdom's light, you will see these aspects of any activity you are involved in, be it seeing, smelling, 
tasting, touching, feeling through the body, or thinking. The behavioral aspect of wisdom is non-confusion. When insight is present, the mind is no longer confused by mistaken concepts about or delusive perceptions of mind and matter. Seen clearly, bright and unconfused, the mind begins to fill with a new kind of faith known as verified faith. Verified faith is neither blind nor unfounded. It comes directly from personal experience or reality. One must compare it to the faith that raindrops will get us wet. The scriptures formally characterize this kind of faith as a decision based on direct personal experience. Thus, we see a very close association between faith and wisdom. Verified faith does not arise because you hear statements you find plausible. No comparative study, scholarly research, no abstract reasoning can bring it. Nor it is shoved down your throat by some Sado, Roshi, Riponshi or spiritual group. Your own direct personal intuitive experience brings about this firm and durable kind of faith. The most important way to develop and realize verified faith is practice in conformity with instructions from scriptures. The Satipatthana method of meditation is sometimes viewed as narrow and oversimplified. It may appear so from the outside, but when wisdom begins to unfold during deep practice, personal experience shatters this myth of narrowness. Vipassana brings a wisdom that is far from narrow. It is panoramic and expansive. In the presence of faith, one can spontaneously notice that the mind has become crystal clear and is free from disturbances and pollution. At this time, too, the mind fills with peace and clarity. The function of verified faith is to bring together the five controlling faculties discussed in the last chapter, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, and to clarify them. They become alert and effective, and their active properties will be more efficiently deployed to bring about a calm, powerful, incisive meditative state, one which is bound to be successful in overcoming not only the seventh but all the other nine armies of Mara as well. Four powers which motivate successful practice. In practice, as much as in worldly endeavors, a vigorous and strong-minded person is quite sure to accomplishing whatever she or he desires. Vigor and strength of mind are only two of the four powers which motivate a successful practice. 
chand is willingness the first power virya is energy or vigor the second strength of the mind is third and wisdom or knowledge is the fourth if these four factors provide the driving force for practice once meditation will unfold whether one has any desire to gain results from it or not one can even reach nibbana in this way the buddha gave a rather homely example which illustrates just how the results of meditation are attained if mother hen lays an egg with a sincere wish for it to hatch but then runs off and leaves the egg exposed to nature's elements the egg will soon rot if on the other hand the mother hen is conscientious in her duties towards the egg sitting on it for long periods every day the warmth of her body will keep the egg from rotting and will also permit the chick within it to grow sitting on the egg is mother hen's most important duty she must do this in a proper way with her wings slightly spread out to protect the nest from rain see she must also take care not to sit heavily and crack the her egg if she sits in proper style and for sufficient time the egg will naturally naturally receive the warmth it needs to hatch inside the shell an embryo develops the beak and claws day by day the shell grows thinner during mother hen's brief excursions from the nest the chick inside may see a light that slowly brightens after 3 weeks or so a healthy yellow chick pecks its way out of this claustrophobic space this result happens regardless of whether the hen foresaw the outcome all she did was sit on the egg with sufficient regularity mother hens are very dedicated and committed to their task at times they would rather be hungry and thirsty than get up from the egg if they if they do have to get up they go about their errands as efficiently as possible and then return to their sitting practice i am not recommending that you skip meals or stop drinking liquids or cease going to the bathroom i would simply like you to be inspired by the hen's patience and persistence imagine if she became fickle and restless sitting for few minutes and then going out to do something else for few minutes her egg would quickly rot and the chick would lose its chance for life so too for the yogi if during sitting meditation you are prone to giving in to all those whims to scratch to shift to squirm then the heat of the energy will not be continuous enough to keep the mind fresh and free from the attacks by the rotting influence of mental obstructions and difficulties such as the five mental fetters mentioned above which are sense desire attachment to our own bodies and to the bodies of others gluttony and craving for future future sensual pleasures as a result of not being in proper meditation practice 
A yogi who tries to be mindful in each moment generates a persistent stream of energy like the persistent heat of mother hen's body. This heat aspect of energy prevents the mind from rotting from its exposures to Kilesa's attacks. And it also permits insight to grow and mature through its development stages. All the five of the mental fetters arise in the absence of attention. If one is not careful when there is contact with the pleasurable sense object, the mind will be filled with craving and clinging. The first mental fetter. With mindfulness, however, sense desire is overcome. Similarly, if one can penetrate the truth of the nature of the body, attachment to it can also disappear. Our infatuation within the bodies of others diminishes in turn. Thus, the second and third mental fetters are broken. Close attention to the whole process of eating cuts through gluttony, the fourth mental fetter. If one carries out this whole practice with the aim of realizing Nibbana, hankering after mundane pleasures, one might obtain in the afterlife will also disappear. Wishing for rebirth in subtle realms is the fifth fetter of the mind. Thus, continuous mindfulness and energy overcome all five fetters. When these fetters are broken, we are no longer bound in the dark, constricted mental state. Our minds are free to emerge into the light. With continued effort, mindfulness and concentration, the mind slowly fills with warmth of the Dhamma which keeps it fresh and scorches the kilesas. The Dhamma fragrance penetrates throughout and the shell of ignorance grows thinner and more transsucculent. Yogis begin to understand mind and matter and the conditional conditionality of all things. Faith based on direct experience arises. They understand directly how mind and matter are interrelated by a process of cause and effect, rather than being moved by the actions and decisions of independent self. By inference, they realize that this same causal process existed in the past and will also continue into the future. As practice deepens, one gains deep confidence, no longer doubting oneself and one's practice. Other yogis or teachers The mind is filled with gratitude for the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Then one begins to see the appearing and disappearing of things and realizes their impermanent nature, their suffering and lack of a permanent self. Upon the occurrence of such insights, Ignorance of these aspects disappears, like the chick about to hatch. At this point, you will see a lot of light coming through the shell. Awareness of object moves ahead at a faster and faster pace. You will be filled with a sort of energy you have never experienced before, and great faith will arise. If you continue to incubate your wisdom, you will be led forward to the experience of Nibbana or 
Mag Pala Path and Fruition Conscientiousness You will emerge from the shell of darkness just like the chick who filled with enthusiasm to find itself in the great world runs about the sunny farmyard with its mother so too will you be filled with happiness and bliss yogis who have experienced nibbana feel a unique new found happiness and bliss their faith energy mindfulness and concentration becomes particularly st- strong i hope you will take this analogy of mother hen into deep consideration just as she hatches her chicks without hope or desire merely carrying out her duties in a conscientious way so may you well incubate and hatch your practice may you not become a rotten egg captain of my own ship i have spent a lot of time here on doubt and related problems because i know they are quite serious and i want to help you avoid them i know personally how much suffering doubt can cause when i was 28 or 29 years old i began to meditate under the venerable mahasi sadhu my predecessor and the head of lineage of mahasi sasana yatika the meditation center in rangoon After about a week at the meditation center I began to feel quite critical of my fellow meditators Some monks who were supposed to be meditating were not perfect in their morality They did not seem scrupulous or meticulous to me The lay meditators too seem to communicate and move about in an uncivilized impolite manner doubt began to fill my mind even my teacher one of mahasi sadhu's assistants came under the fire of my critical mind this man never smiled and was sometimes abrupt and harsh i felt that a meditation teacher should be filled with softness and solicitude a competent meditation teacher can make quite an educated guess about a yogi's situation based on experience with many yogis as well as on scriptural study the master who was teaching me was no exception he saw my practice begin to regress guessing that a doubt attack was responsible he gave me a very gentle and skillful scolding afterwards I went back to my room and did some soul searching. I asked myself, why did I come here? To criticize others and test the teacher? No. I realized that I had come to the center to th- get rid of as many as I could. of the kilesas i had accumulated through my journey in samsara i hoped to accomplish this goal by practicing the dhamma of the buddha in the meditative tradition 
of the center where I was. This reflection was a great clarification for me. A smile popped into my mind. It was as if I had been on a sailboat. Out at sea, I had been caught in a raging storm. Huge waves rose up and crushed down again on every side. Blown from left to right, up and down, I rocked helplessly in the mighty ocean. Around me, other boats were in the same predicament. Instead of managing my own boat, I had been barking orders at the other captains. Better put up the sails. Hey, you, better take them down. If I had remained a busy body, I might well have found myself at the bottom of the ocean. That is what I learned for myself. After that, I worked very hard and entertained no more doubts in my mind. I even became a favorite of my teacher. I hope you can benefit from this experience of mine. Eighth Army Conceit and Ingratitude Having overcome doubt, the yogi begins to realize some aspects of the Dhamma. Unfortunately, the Eighth Army of Mara lies in wait in the form of conceit and ingratitude. Conceit arises when yogis begin to experience joy, rapture, delight, and other interesting things in practice. At this point, they may wonder whether their teacher has actually attained this wondrous stage yet, whether other yogis are practicing as hard as they are, and so forth. Conceit most often happens at the stage of insight when yogis perceive the momentary arising and passing away of phenomena. It is a wonderful experience of being perfectly present, seeing how objects arise and pass away at the very moment when mindfulness alights on them. At this particular stage, a host of defilements can arise. They were specifically known as the Vipassana Kilesas, defilements of insight. Since these defilements can become a harmful obstacle, it is important for yogis to understand them clearly. The scriptures tell us that mana or conceit has the characteristic of bubbly energy, of a great zeal and enthusiasm arising in the mind. One overflows with energy and is filled with self-centered, self-glorifying thoughts like, I am so great, no one can compare with me. A prominent aspect of conceit is stiffness and rigidity. One's mind feels stiff and bloated like a python that has just swallowed some other creature. This aspect of mana is also reflected as tension in the body and posture. Its victims get 
big headed and stiff necked and thus may find it difficult to bow respectfully to others. Forgetting others help. Conceit is really a fearsome mental state. It destroys gratitude, making it difficult to acknowledge that one owes any kind of debt to other person. Forgetting the good deeds others have done for us in the past. One belittles them and denigrates their virtues. Not only that, but one also actively conceals the virtues of others so that no one will hold them in esteem. This attitude towards one's benefactors is the second aspect of conceit, rigidity being the first. All of us have had benefactors in our lives, especially in childhood and younger days. Our parents, for example, gave us love, education and the necessities of life at a time when we were helpless. Our teachers gave us knowledge. Friends helped us when we got into trouble. Remembering our debts to those who have helped us, we feel humbled and grateful and we hope for a chance to help them in return. It is precisely this gentle state that defeats Mara's Eighth Army. Yet it is very common to find people who don't recognize the good that has been done for them in the past. Perhaps a lay person finds himself or herself in trouble and a compassionate friend offers help. Thanks to this help, the person manages to improve his or her circumstances. Later, however, he or she may demonstrate no gratitude at all, may even turn and speak harshly to the benefactor. What have you ever done to me? Such behavior is far from unknown in this world. Even a monk may become arrogant, feeling he has reached fame and popularity as a teacher only through his own hard work. He forgets his preceptors and teachers who may have helped him since his childhood days as a novice. They will have told him the scriptures provided him with requisites of life, instructed him in meditation, given him advice, and admonished him when appropriate, so that he grew up to be responsible, cultured, civilized young monk. Come the age of independence, this monk may reveal great talent, he gives good Dhamma talks that are well received by the audience. People respect him. Give him many presents and invite him to distant places to teach. Having reached a higher station in life, the monk may become rather arrogant. One day, perhaps, his old teacher approaches him and says, Congratulations, I have been watching you ever since you were a small novice. Having helped you in so many ways, it does my heart good to see you doing so well. 
The young monk snaps back. What have you done for me? I worked hard for this. Problems can occur in the Dhamma family as in any human family. In any family, one should always adopt a positive, loving and compassionate attitude towards resolving difficulties. Imagine how it could be if the member of the world family could get together with love and compassion and consideration for each other when a disagreement arises. In this world, there are ways to solve problems which may not be very fruitful but are unfortunately widespread. Instead of acting directly and from fellowship and love, a family member might start to wash dirty linen in public, might belittle other family members, or criticize their personalities and virtues either directly or indirectly. Before hurling insults, and accusations at other family members, one should consider one's own state of mind and circumstances. The tendency to lash out, defame, and belittle is an aspect of conceit. The scriptures illustrate it with the image of a person enraged taking up a handful of excrement to fling at his or her opponent. This person befouls himself or herself even before the opponent. So, if there are matter on which we disagree, please let us all try to exercise patience and forgiveness in the spirit of the good-hearted. Imagine a traveler on a long and arduous journey. In the middle of a long hot day, he or she comes across a tree by the side of the road, a leafy tree with deep cool shade. The traveler is delighted and lies down at the roots of this tree for a nice nap. If the traveler cuts down the tree before he goes on his or her way, this is what the scriptures call ungrateful. Such a person does not understand the benevolence a friend has shown. We have a responsibility to do more than refrain from chopping down our benefactors. It is true that in this world, there are times when we cannot repay what we owe to those who have helped us. We will, nonetheless, be regarded as a good-hearted person if we can at least remember their acts of benevolence. If we can find a way to repay our debt, we should of course do so. It is quite irrelevant whether our benefactor is more virtuous than we, or is a rascal, or happens to be our equal in virtue. The only requirement for him or her to gain the status of benefactor is to have helped us in the past. Once upon a time, a man worked very hard to support his mother. As it turned out, she was a promiscuous woman. She tried to hide this from her son. But eventually, some gossiping villagers 
disclose her activities to him. He answered, Run along, friends. As long as my mom is happy, whatever she chooses to do is fine. My only duty is to work and support her. This was a very intelligent young man. He understood the limits of his own responsibility. He repay his debt of gratitude to her who had borne and suckled him. Beyond this, his mother's behavior was her own business. This man was one of the two types of rare and precious people in the world. The first type of rare and precious person is a benefactor. One who is benevolent and kind, who helps another person for noble reasons. The Buddha was one of these, sparing no effort to help beings liberate themselves from the suffering of samsara. All of us owe him grateful remembrance and we might even consider our diligence in practice to be a form of repayment. The second type of rare and precious person is the one who is grateful, who appreciates the good that has been done for him or her, and who tries to repay it when the time is ripe. I hope you will be both type of rare and precious person and will not succumb to the Eighth Army of Mara. Ninth Army Gain, Praise, Honor, Undeserved Fame The Ninth Army of Mara is Gain, Praise, Honor, and Undeserved Fame. You will attain some depth of practice. Your manner and behavior will improve. You will become venerable and impressive. You may even start to share the Dhamma with others. Or your experience of the Dhamma may manifest outwardly in another way. Perhaps in clear expositions of the scriptures. People may feel deep faith in you and may bring you gifts and donations. Word may spread that you are an enlightened person, that you give great Dhamma discourses. At this point, it would be very easy for you to succumb to the ninth army of Mara. The honor and respect these, pre these people direct toward you could go to your head. You might begin to subtly or overtly try to extract bigger and better donations from your followers. You might decide that you deserve renown because you really are superior to other people or insincere ambition might supplant a genuine wish to help others as you as your motivation for teaching for sharing whatever wisdom you have reached in your own practice your reflections might run as follows oh i'm pretty great i'm popular with many people I wonder if anyone else is great as I am. Can I get my devotees to buy me a new car? The first battalion of the Ninth Army is material gain. The gifts one receives from devotees and admirers. The reverence of these same people is the second battalion. 
the third battalion is fame or renown. In the outer world, Mara's ninth army attacks mostly those yogis who've had a good result in meditation. But it is quite unnecessary to have a band of followers. Wishes for gain can attack the most ordinary yogi in the form of desires for grander accommodations or new outfits to wear while on retreat. One might feel proud of one's practice and begin wishing to be acknowledged as a great yogi. People whose practice is not very deep are most susceptible to deluding themselves about their own achievements. A yogi who has had an interesting experience or two, but little depth, can become overconfident. He or she may quickly want to step out onto the Dhamma scene and teach other people, thus becoming the object of admiration and praise. Such persons will teach a pseudo-vipassana that is not in accordance with the text, nor with deep practical experience. They may actually harm their students. Sincerity To vanquish this ninth army, the motivation behind your effort must be sincere. If you begin practicing only with the hope of getting donations, reverence or fame, you will never make any progress. Frequent re-examination of motives can be very helpful. If you make genuine, sincere progress and later succumb to greed for gain, you will become intoxicated and negligent. It is said that a person who is intoxicated and negligent will continue a life of peacelessness and be overcome by much suffering. Satisfied with cheap gain, this person forgets the purpose of meditation, performs unskillful actions and fails to cultivate wholesomeness, his or her practice will regress. Perhaps, though, we believe there is an end to suffering and that we can attain this by end by practicing the Dhamma. This is the sincere motivation that prevents us from falling into greed for worldly gain and fame. Life means coming into being. For humans, it means a very painful birth process, with death waiting at the end. In between these two events, we experience falling sick, accidents, the pain of aging. There is also emotional pain, not getting what we desire, depressions and losses, unavoidable associations with persons and objects we dislike. To be freed from all this pain, we sit in meditation, practicing the Dhamma, the path that ends in supramundane release of Nibbana. Some of us go to retreats, leaving behind worldly activities such as business, education, social obligations, and the pursuit of pleasure, because we have faith that suffering can come to an end. Actually, we can legitimately consider as a retreat any place where you strive to extinguish the kilesas. When you go to such a place, even it is 
the it is in the corner of the living room set aside for meditation the pali word for you is pabbajita meaning one who has gone forth from the world in order to extinguish the kilesas why would one want to extinguish them kilesas or defilements have a tremendous power to torture and oppress those who are not free of them they are likened to a fire which burns and tortures and torments when kilesas arise in a being they burn him or her they bring exhaustion torment and oppression there is not a single good thing to be said about kilesas the three types of kilesas kilesa are of three kinds the defilements of transgression the defilements of obsession and the latent or dormant defilements defilements of transgression occur when people cannot keep the basic precepts and perform actions of killing stealing sexual misconduct lying and intoxication the second class of kilesa is a bit more subtle one may not outwardly commit any immoral action but one's mind will be obsessed with desires to kill and destroy hurt and harm others physically or otherwise obsessive wishes may fill the mind to steal property manipulate people deceive others to obtain some desired object if you have ever experienced this kind of obsession you know it is a very painful state if a person fails to control the obsessive kilesas he or she is likely to hurt other beings in one way or another dormant or latent kilesas are ordinarily not apparent they lie hidden waiting for the right conditions to assault the helpless mind dormant kilesas may be likened to a person deeply asleep as such a person awakes when his or her mind begins to churn it is as if the obsessive kilesas have arisen when the person stands up from the bed and becomes involved in the day's activities this is like moving from the obsessive kilesas to the kilesas of transgression these three aspects can also be discovered in a match stick its phosphorus tip is like the dormant kilesas the flame that results from striking is like the obsessive kilesas the forest fire that ensues from careless handling of the flame is like the kilesas of transgression extinguishing the kilesas fire if you are sincere in applying sila samadhi and panya you can overcome extinguish and give up all three kinds of kilesas sila puts aside the kilesas of transgression samadhi suppresses 
the obsessive ones and wisdom uproots talent or dormant kilesis which are the cause of the other two as you practice in this way you can gain new kinds of happiness by practicing sila the delight of sensual pleasures is replaced by the happiness that comes from sincerity of conduct morality due to the absence of the kilesas of transgression a moral person lives a relatively pure clean and blissful life we practice sila by keeping the five basic precepts mentioned in the first chapter and more generally by following the morality group of the noble eightfold path right action right speech and right livelihood all of which are based on not harming others or oneself you may wonder whether true purity of conduct is possible in the world of course it is however it is much easier to be pure in one's precepts in a retreat where situations are simplified and temptations are kept to a minimum this is especially true if one wishes to practice more than the basic five precepts or if one is a monk or a nun and therefore obliged to follow many rules on retreat one can achieve a very high success rate for any of these difficult endeavors purity of conduct is only a first step if we want to extinguish more than the coarse kilesas some internal practice is necessary the obsessive kilesas are vanquished by the samadhi or the concentration group of the noble eightfold path which consists of right effort right mindfulness and right concentration a continuous and persistent effort is needed to note and be aware of the objects that arise in each moment without straying away this kind of endeavor is difficult to maintain in a worldly context with continuous moment to moment effort mindfulness and concentration the obsessive kilesas can be kept far from the mind the mind can enter into the object of meditation and stay there unscattered the obsessive kilesas have no chance to arise unless there is momentary slip in the practice freedom from these kilesas brings about a state of mind known as upasama sukha the well-being and bliss of tranquility which results from freedom from the oppressive kilesas the mind is free from lust greed anger and agitation when one has known this happiness one sees it as superior to sense pleasure and considers it a worthwhile exchange to have put aside sensual joys to obtain it there is a better kind of happiness 
even than this. So one should not become complacent. Taking a further step, one can practice wisdom. With wisdom, the dormant kilesas can be abandoned momentarily and perhaps also permanently. When mindfulness is well developed along with its associated factors such as energy and concentration, one begins to understand very intuitively the nature of mind and matter. The Wisdom Group of the Noble Eightfold Path Right View and Right Thought begins to be fulfilled as one naturally moves through the successive stages of insight. At every occurrence of insight, the dormant kilesas are extinguished. Through the gradual progress of insight, one may attain the noble path consciousness in which dormant kilesas are permanently extinguished. Thus, with deep practice, the torture of the kilesas will diminish, will perhaps even disappear forever. In this case, gain and respect and fame will come very naturally to you, but you will not get caught in them. They will seem paltry compared to the noble goal and dedication of your practice. Since you are sincere, you will never stop adding to your foundation of morality. You will make use of gain and fame in a fitting way and will continue with your practice. Tenth Army Self Exhalation and Disparaging Others All of us have some awareness of the fact of suffering. It is present in birth, in life, and in death. Painful experiences in life often leads us to want to overcome suffering and live in freedom and peace. Perhaps it is this wish, this faith, or perhaps even a firm conviction of this that led you to read this book. In the course of our practice, this fundamental aim may be undermined by certain byproducts of the practice itself. We have discussed how gain, respect and fame can become obstacles to liberation. So, too, can the closely related problems of self exhalation and disparaging others, the Tenth Army of Mara. This is a battle faced by meditation masters. Self exhalation often attacks after some gain in practice. Perhaps a feeling of maturity in our precepts. We might become quite cocky, looking around and saying, look at that person, they are not keeping the precepts. They are not holy as I am, not as pure. If this happens, we have fallen victim to the tenth army of Mara. This last army is perhaps the most lethal of them all. In the Buddha's time, there was even a man, Devadatta, 
who tried to kill the Buddha under its influence. He had grown proud of his psychic powers, his attainments in concentration, and his position as a disciple. Yet, when sub subversive thoughts came, he had no mindfulness, no defense against them. The Essence of the Holy Life it is possible to take delight in our own purity without disparaging others and without self-admiration. A simile might be useful here. Consider a valuable timber tree whose core is the most precious part. We can compare this tree with the holy life described by the Buddha, Sila, Samadhi, Panya. In cross-section, the tree trunk is revealed to be made of the precious core, the woody tissue, the inner bark, and finally the thin epidermis of outer bark. A tree also has branches and fruits. The holy life is composed of sila, samadhi, and panya. It includes the path of fruition, attainments, or experiences of nibbana. There are also psychic powers, including, we might say, the psychic power of penetrating into the true nature of reality by Vipassana insight. Then there are the gain, respect, and fame which can come to one through the practice. One woodcutter may go into the forest seeking the tree's pith for some important purpose. Finding this big, handsome timber tree he or she cuts off all the branches and takes them home. There the woodcutter finds that the branches and leaves are useless for the intended purpose. This is like a person satisfied with gain and fame. Another person may strip the thin outer bark from the tree. This is like a yogi who, content with purity of conduct, does not work to develop the mind any further. The third yogi, perhaps a bit more intelligent, realizes that morality is not the end of the road. There is a mental development to be considered. He or she may take up some form of meditation and work very hard. Attaining one-pointedness of mind, this yogi feels great. The mind is still and content, full of bliss and rapture. Such a person may even master the jhanas or absorption states of deep concentration. Then the thought becomes, boy, am I feeling great. But the person next to me is as relentless as ever. This yogi feels he or she has attained the essence of vipassana and the holy life. But instead, he or she has only been attacked by the 10th army of Mara. This is like a woodcutter who is content with the inner bark of the tree and has not yet touched the core. More ambitious, another yogi determines to develop the psychic powers. 
he or she attains them and is filled with pride. Moreover, it is a lot of fun to play with those new abilities. The thought may come, wow, this is far out. It must be the essence of the Dhamma. Not everyone can do it either. That woman over there can't see what, what's right under her nose. The devas and hell beings. If this person does not break free from the tenth army of Mara, he or she will become intoxicated and negligent in developing wholesome states of mind. His or her life will be accompanied by great suffering. Psychic powers are not truly liberating either. In this present age, many people are inspired by certain individuals who have developed paranormal psychic powers. For some reason, even a small display of psychic ability seems to draw a great deal of faith from people. It was the same in the Buddha's time. In fact, there was once a layman who approached the Buddha with the suggestion that the Buddha should campaign for his teaching on a basis of demonstrating psychic power. For this purpose, the Buddha should widely deploy all of his disciples who also had psychic powers and ask them to demonstrate miracles to the people. People will be really impressed, the layman said. You'll get a lot of followers that way, they said. The Buddha refused. Three times the request was repeated and three times it was refused. Finally, the Buddha said, Layman, there are three types of psychic powers. One is the power to fly in the air and dive into the earth and to perform other superhuman feats. The second is the power to read other people's minds. You can tell a person, ah, on such and such a day you were thinking that and you went out to do this. People can be very impressed with this. There is a third psychic power, the power of instruction, whereby one can tell another, ah, you have such and such a behavior that is not good. It is unwholesome, unskillful, not conductive to your welfare or that of others. You should abandon that and practice in such a way as to cultivate wholesome actions. Then you should meditate as I will now instruct you. Now, this power, a power to guide another person on the right path, is the most important psychic power. O oh, layman, if the first two powers are displayed to a person who have faith in vipassana, it will not undermine their faith. But there are those who are not by nature faithful. And they would say, well, that's nothing very special. I know of other sects and other religious systems wherein people can also attain such and such powers through mantras and also esoteric practices. People like that will misunderstand my teaching. The third type of psychic power is the best, that of being able to instruct others. O oh, layman, when one can say, this is bad, do not do it. You should cultivate good speech and behavior. This is the way 
to cleanse your mind of kilesas. This is how to meditate. This is the way to attain the bliss of Nibbana, which liberates you from all suffering. This, O oh layman, is the best psychic power. By all means, go ahead and try to attain psychic powers if this interests you. It is not essential, but it does not contradict vipassana practice. There's no one to stop you, and the achievements certainly is not anything one can scoff at. Just do not mistake psychic powers for the essence of the teachings. A person who attains psychic powers and then believes he or she has reached the end of spiritual path is much deluded. Such people seek the pith of the timber tree but are satisfied to reach only the woody outer layer. Bringing it home, they will find it of no use. So, after you attain psychic powers, please go on and develop the various vipassana insights, successive path and fruition moments, until the realization of arahantship. When mindfulness and concentration are well developed, the vipassana insight that penetrates into the various levels of the true nature of things will arise. This is also a form of psychic knowledge, but it is not yet the end of the path. You may eventually attain the sotapatti path, the noble conscientiousness of the stream entrant which is the first stage of enlightenment. Path Consciousness, the first dip into Nibbana, uproots certain kilesas forever. You may continue to practice and also develop the fruition consciousness. When this consciousness arises, the mind dwells in the bliss of Nibbana, it is said that this liberation is unbounded by time. Once you have put forth the effort to attain it, you can return to it any time. However, these lower attainments still fall short of the Buddha's purpose, which was to attain full enlightenment, that final liberating consciousness which extinguishes all suffering forever. After he had finished constructing the simile of the timber tree, the Buddha said, The benefit of my teachings does not lie simply in gain, respect and fame. The benefit of my teachings does not lie merely in purity of conduct. It not it does not lie merely in the attainment of jhanas. It does not lie merely in the attainment of psychic powers as well. It has its essence, the total liberation from kilesas that is attain, attainable at any time. I hope you will gather up strength energy and a great deal of courage to face the ten armies of Mara and to vanquish all of them with merciless compassion so that you may be able to go through the various vipassana insights. May you at least attain the noble consciousness of the stream entrant in this very life. And after that, May you be liberated totally and finally from all suffering.